And we're live. What's up, everybody? I'm here with Mr. David Drew. What up? Good morning. It's morning for us. Yeah, it's morning, indeed. So you're a legitimate black belt. <laughs> we're going go straight into that. <laughs> right there. There's no even. Straight into it. Um, I want to know. I want to know everything there is to know. <laughs> I want to know kung fu when this is over. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but it was actually it's taekwondo. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, Korean style taekwondo. Uh, we're ITF style. There's a division within the the taekwondo community in the U.S. There's the uh, International Taekwondo Federation and then the World Taekwondo Federation. They're really it's like uh, in you know football, you know, your east and west. It's not that different. Um, just just two different organizations that want to manage the um, the overall distribution of, of taekwondo in the states. And so they the discipline by and large the movements and the discipline are the same, but just they teach some slightly different material based right. on who established them. Um, so my school or dojo or whatever you want to call it um was itf format um and so anyone who follows that stuff will kind of know what i'm talking about yeah when did you start um around i was around seven or eight years old um and you know like like most uh parents in the states um you know put i have an older sister so they put my sister and i into different kinds of athletics or just you know, throw throw everything. You know, throw the paint on the wall, see what sticks, kind of yeah. thing. Um, and uh, you know, I did soccer. I was terrible at soccer. <laughs> um, I was always the kid who kicked the ball into the our goal. You know, that was oh, that was me. That yeah, yeah, I was yeah. really good at that. I hated that guy. I, that was me. Yeah, that was me. That was <laughs> I hated you. Yeah, I was five. So thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm open. No one's blocking me. Boom. Um, um, did that, uh, I don't know what else I did when I was younger. I think I tried baseball, like the eye-hand coordination wasn't there, whatever, other stuff. Yeah. Just wasn't happening. And then um, that was in like the early 90s, so that was the time when uh, Ninja Turtles was big on TV. Oh, yeah. And then Power Rangers dropped in like 93, 94. Um, and all of a sudden, like, I'm flying around the house doing, you know, punches and kicks and stuff. And my parents were like... Hey, you know what? Uh, maybe we should try putting him in like a martial arts thing because that was also the time when it was all over the TV. Like all yeah. the commercials were like, "Come to our karate gym. We'll teach your kids discipline and self respect." <laughs> and um, so right. they found one that was. Um, I was living in Stafford, Virginia, which is uh, just south of Quantico, um, and there was another one, the next little county down, which is Fredericksburg. Um, there was a school that was there that you know people were talking about, so they brought me down there. And I, I took to it like a fish in water. Like, I just, I loved it. I loved being there. Awesome. Um, and I did really well because even my parents still remember to this day, they'll bring it up every once in a while as parents do. Like, remember when you first started and there was a, a Korean owner, I think his name was Master Ree. Um, and, and he gave me a, like a lot of individualized praise for yeah. the time that I was there, which was very short because um, it was further south. And as often is the case with martial arts schools, the classes are in the afternoon time, you yeah. know, after school. Right. So getting south on 95, anyone who has to frequent 95 knows going south on 95 during the time when people are going home, you know, post, post work rush hour um, mm -hmm. is impossible. So very, very often I'd end up late yeah. to the class and we'd leave 30 minutes, 40 minutes early, you know, right. and just, and I mean, I was, six at the time so it's not like I was you know part of part of the the involvement of like getting me there or, you know tell, tell my parents it's time to go like I was too little right. to, to be like that but um you know we tried for a while and that didn't work out um that school was called Black Belt College of America which was also Taekwondo um coincidentally and then and then a school opened up in Stafford cool um anyone who's familiar with Stafford there was a, a little area called the a quiet town center which had like a movie theater and I think a, a, a Mexican restaurant and that was it at the time yeah. in the 90s. It was mostly just trees. It hadn't been developed. Now it's it's fully developed. It's right. all the all the trees and everything. Are Did you live in a quiet harbor? Oh. We I were lived, on the other side of, of that one. Yeah. I lived in a quiet harbor. Yeah, Sean and I actually lived <laughs> in the same town for a few years. Yeah. Although we so never met. We left we would have left in ninety two. Right. So that's right when this journey was starting with that's, your Taekwondo. Yeah, because we, we lived in Woodbridge for a time. Got it. And then we moved down to Stafford Crazy. because I, my, we were living in a townhome in Woodbridge. And yeah. then my parents found a house 
And then, so then they, they, you know, made the, cool. started doing the mortgage and stuff on the house. Was it always, like, th was the goal always Taekwondo, or did you just kind of stumble into Taekwondo, like, that was the only school around, or did you intentionally look, and say, I want to do Taekwondo over right. karate, or... Whatever? Right, um, no, that's, in the time there wasn't, especially in the 90s, there was a lot of middling of, of what the different disciplines are, and my parents didn't research didn't, enough to know. Right. Yeah, they just, you know, like, Karate Kid was, you know, big that time. I think the second Karate Kid movie yeah. came out right in the early 90s, because yeah. I think the first one was, like, late 80s. Um, so that's what everyone knew. Anything that involved punching and kicking and belts yep. was probably called karate, regardless if it was actually Kung Fu or Taekwondo or whatever else. Yeah. And, again, me, I was so little, like, I... It didn't. I didn't. It, it, it didn't, didn't matter. matter. It didn't right. matter. I was just in it, and I was doing it, and I was pleased, and I was yeah. happy, and, and, and I was learning stuff. And that was the first sport that you kind of connected with? Right, exactly. Wow. Because yeah. before that, I mean, and again, it's not like we didn't do the entire gamut of, of sports yeah. availability with the limited, like, amount of living in a, in a small suburban area, yeah. way away from, like, any kind of big metropolitan city, um, you know, Richmond. Richmond or DC were both an hours out either direction, yeah. um, so you only had so many so many things you could try to take on to. Yeah, that's pretty funny. We were in the same area, and you took to martial arts, and I took to swimming. Right, and that's that was another big sport around that area wow. because I did end up on a swim team hmm. much later on. My sister and I did swim team in middle school. Yeah, and because there was um, there was like a sports facility. It wasn't like a Globo gym, but it was like a it was called uh, Parks and Rec. Um, and so, something, 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 Parks and Rec. Yeah. Um, and they had, you know, gym machines. You had your typical machines. They had, like, a squash court, so you could play, like, That's racquetball cool. indoors. Yeah. They had a, and they had three big pools. And that was where you always went in the summertime, is you went to the Parks and Rec, and you went swimming at the pools. Yeah. Um, and then they, because they were, like, a private, you know, frou-frou for the 90s club. Right. Um, but they, they, because they were... Uh, centralized in the community you know the owners lived there and they had been there for a while so they created a swim team um, with their swim coaches and they would do yearly competitions so I did swim for a while and I was terrible at it <laughs> I got disqualified every meet because I always did something wrong I have no idea what I always did wrong to I, this day I, I touched I touched the top too early or I touched the side the wrong way or my yeah. foot went too far I don't know there's a lot of silly rules in swimming. Yeah, there, there was a lot. And it was too much. It was too much for me. Um, but, I, you know, I did it. I tried it. I got into it. Yeah. Um, I liked going and swimming, uh, and I liked swimming competitively. I liked the, the competitive aspect of it. Right. I just couldn't stay in that, yeah. whatever that space is, to do it, like, right and have it matter. And I was DQ! Right. DQ. But you, you got into that mindset in martial arts. Mm. And so, walk me through that. When when did it when when did it change in your mind from something your parents put you into that you like going to to like, oh wow, this is a martial arts study. Right. I am good at this. I am training for this. Right. So um, most it, most like westernized programs, I would say typically, uh, if they're focused on kids, which most of them are, um, usually look at like a two to three maybe four year program for beginner to like your first black belt um so you you stay in it for a pretty good amount of time and it takes you're always checking in you know the owners and the coaches are always checking in with you to see like where you are in your life and see if it's still a good fit for where you are you know most kids they're just they're just come the whole way through and as long as the parents can afford the programs they're there for the whole time right um but every once in a while you'll start to notice um, now I'm starting to kind of go into the coaching side of it, but you'll notice when kids are struggling yeah. and you start to investigate the reasons why they might be struggling. Right. It might be school related. It might be life related. It might just be specifically like they're just not getting what's going on because yeah. the materials does start to advance, um, as you go in the later, the higher degrees of belts. Yep. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's nice when it's just like punch, one punch and one kick and one step. And then all of a sudden you have to start combining all these things together yeah. and moving in really specific sort of ways. And, you know, we don't, as coaches, we didn't expect kids to execute things perfectly, but we would, we would demand a certain level of competency For sure. from most students yeah. and then create some wiggle room forward and backward, depending on the student's individual needs. Um, but for me, it was 
probably right before, uh, right in that range before I tested for my very first black belt. Where, because at that point I started when I was eight, so at that time I was like eleven. Okay. Um, and we started doing a bunch of competitions. There was always there's always competitions, martial arts competitions rolling throughout the year. There's like local ones and state ones, and then you know regional ones and all that stuff. Um, and when I started placing like first place again and again and again and again and again and I was like oh okay all right I'm gonna I'm gonna keep riding this and see where it yeah. goes and then when I tested for my black belt um the way my my school did it my my coach did it she would uh back in back in that time um she would have herself and like the one or two other coaches at the gym yeah. and then she would try and get some guest coaches to come in and like bring some credence to the process a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so mine, I was, uh, yeah, this is goes back to the 90s too. Anyone who's familiar with the Mortal Kombat movie that came out in the 90s, which was hype, it's still uh, still a great movie. It's yeah. not that good. But, um, <laughs> but one of the actors, one of the fight actors who played uh, Reptile, if you're yeah. familiar with the, with the movie and the characters, that martial artist, I wish I could remember his name off the top of my head, right. I don't. But he was there at my test. No kidding. Yeah. And then... Um, did you finish him? No, I wish I <laughs> he, he didn't participate. He was just there. But it was cool. It was cool to meet him. Um, and in our testing system, this is probably exclusive to us. Other gyms do their own different thing. Other schools do their own thing. But we have, like, your score. And if you, you know, pass, then you pass. But if you get, like, high marks on everything, then you get, like, an outstanding grade. Okay. And then there's a, a very small special ceremony. The the owner comes and she ties your belt around you, and you know, like, congr- you know, shakes your yeah. hand, like, oh, you did really good. I'm so proud of you. Blah blah blah. That's awesome. Um, and I got an outstanding on my black belt test, and I was the only one. Wow. Um, so that to me was just like, all right, like, like I'm I'm I feel confident that I know what I'm doing, and I want to keep going with this. Wow. And most kids get to their black belt, and then they're done. Yeah. And then that's it. You got it, and that's the goal. And boom, you're out, right? Mm-hmm. You got it. But, you know, for our school, and I think for a lot of schools, um, you know, we consider the black belt to be a mastering of the basics. Mm-hmm. You've learned the basics and you can do them competently. Yeah. So what's next? And yeah. then we have material that's beyond your first, you have your first degree, your first black belt, and then we have a whole set of new curriculum to get to your second degree. And it's totally different stuff. Um, for our school, it's very, fo- the, the lower stuff is focused on um, doing the, the forms, which are the little like specific sort of dance movements where you move in a pattern Got uh, it. and you do set movements and then a couple of like combinations that you would use in a fight and then a couple of um, other fighting maneuvers where we, we put the kids in fighting gear and then they practice fighting. Yeah. Um, but then all the black belt stuff is like some really complex um, forms that have a high degrees of technicality um, some that we brought in from other disciplines. So we have one Japanese style form wow. that's been sort of modified for the Korean style. They're they're pretty similar, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Um, and then we have we bring in some weapons work, which the kids never get to touch any weapons until yeah. this point. And with a few exceptions, sometimes we run some like Saturday fun classes to yeah. like come in, pay, you know, pay twenty bucks, to pay thirty bucks, and you get to play with nunchucks for two hours with the coaches, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, we would do some things like that, but for by and large, most kids would never touch any weapon stuff until this point. So that's like a big deal. And then we push the kids to do um, like board breaking. You know, the breaks is yeah. a very um, uh, a famous thing. I think most people think of martial arts, and they probably in their head see image of dudes breaking sixteen boards or whatever. Right. Um, and then uh, and we push the kids to develop some of their own curriculum, and then um, tech. You know show that they've learned enough stuff and then they can do it. So we, the first thing we have them do is make their own form. And really? so it could be like, it could be short, it could be long, it could be to music, it could be to not music, it could ha- involve other people. Like, we just like, go nuts. Like, we'll guide you, we'll kind of give you the foundations yeah. of it, but you have, it has to be your thing. You right. have to make it. What, so what, the form is, you know, throw a punch, take a step, mm-hmm. you know, do this kick. Mm-hmm. And it's, is it, I would imagine that there's parts that are super controlled and the parts that are explosive. I mean, what what makes a form a form? Yeah, um, there's a lot of complexity to it, and um, some of them can be really basic. The the most basic ones you learn usually use an I shape or like a T shape. So you have a forward movement, maybe a reverse movement, and then a left and a right. 
And so you're just displaying a, a set of controlled moves. Usually, for the, usually the foundation is to teach you something or for you to learn something. So the timing of stepping and moving your arms, mm. the timing of pulling, pulling a move back into um, uh, 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 sort of its setup and then exploding through and being really snappy and yeah. being able to get there quick. But also having your, um, we use stances, which are just a way of placing your body and your feet. Um, some of them are practical, some of them are a little less practical, yeah. but they're all technical. And so they take some technical mastery and they go from easy to like right. really ridiculous. Um, and so you can combine all these things together. And so like in the, in the, in the example of when you have to make your own, um, we have what's like called traditional, which are the deep stances and the really strong posture and everything is really sharp. Yeah. And you do things with a lot of um, specificity to make it look a certain way. Right. And then we have the modern ones or the non-traditional forms, which are like if you went to like a like a freestyle competition you see guys doing tons of spins and back flips and front flips and splits and jumping up and spinning around like those are the showy yeah. there's not as much focus on the form of the movements it's you know about speed and and controlling the speed and doing some kind of tricks that make it look extravagant right you know and doing a triple hundred 540 through kick into a backflip into a split into a jump fold like right. you just get crazy with it. <clears throat> yeah it seems like there's I mean, I guess what I heard from that is that there's there's forms that have a very specific martial application, and then there's forms that are much more artistic. Sure. And is that is that sort of taekwondo in a in a very large nutshell, where you can sort of go artistic with it, or you can keep studying it for you know fight application, or mm -hmm. is it all just kind of the same? How does that break down? Yeah, um, I think it's both. Um... And it, but it you know ultimately comes down to what the person individual wants mm -hmm. from it, what they get out of it. Yeah. You definitely have people who will stay in it, and in the competitive world for for martial arts, um, there are forms competitions. You can see it; it it happens all the time. I follow a YouTube channel that uploads uh, Japanese style form competitions because I really admire the way they do stuff. It's a little different from yeah. us. Um, and they'll upload, you know, every time there's a big competition, they'll upload all the male and all the female competitors wow. doing their stuff. And it's, it, to me, it's always really interesting to watch how, because they all do traditional style. There's no free form style stuff for them. Um, so just watching to the degree of practice that they put in and seeing, like, how, how quick and how strict those movements can be with such accuracy. Um, yeah. And some people just, that's what they do. They want to do just that. And then, but uh, always the, the, the big show, if you want to call it, is the fighting side right. of it. Um, yeah, how do those competitions work? So, um, yeah, walk me through a Taekwondo competition. Yeah, um, so <laughs> for any, anyone who's been a kid and gone to like a big competition, it usually ends up being kind of a bummer um, in a way because you end up doing a lot of waiting. Oh, yeah. Because there's a ton of competitors, and even if there's, like, seven or eight different, like, rings set up, oh, yeah. there's 300 people there, and yeah. you can only run, you know, you can only run one person doing a form at a time, yeah. which is two to three minutes, or you can only have two people fighting at a time, which is, again, two to three minutes. Yep. Um times however many competitors might be there. Oh yeah, I've been at some miserable swim meets. There's right. Only, there's only one pool. Right. Eight lanes. That's right. And very similar. Very similar. So there's a lot of sitting around. Yeah. There's a lot of moving around and bouncing and stretching and all right, let's go practice. All right, let's come back. Let's sit around. Okay, I'm gonna it's it's my heat, so I'm gonna go over to my ring and then I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna wait and watch them all go through. Yeah. You know, each each person usually comes up um, even even in the adult competitor world I, I know they still do this because I've done some competitions as an adult um, like you're they call you up you come up and you bow to the judges and you know you present yourself hello my name is David I'm from power kicks power kicks is the name of my old school I'm yeah. from power kicks martial arts I'm gonna be doing such and such form and then you bow to them and then you do your thing or if you're fighting then you know you just come out and then so they, they, they'll have people who grade the form so right. it'll be a form presentation. Right. So you do your form and very much like a like a figure skating competition yeah. or a gymnastics competition, the judges will have score numbers, a scorecard. Cool. You do your thing, 
they'll grade you on like speed, like speed of your movements, like yeah. crispness, you know, accuracy. They'll be watching your stances, your feet. If you're doing a traditional thing, they'll be seeing, okay, did, did you hit the right angle between yeah. your front foot and your back foot? Right. Was your heel up or was it down? Is it supposed to be up or was it supposed to yeah. be down? Like all those so they're things. just judging all the, all the little nuances of the movement, which obviously they're experts at, at these forms. So they, right. they, they know what to look for. Right. All the judges are black belts, at least first degree black belts, right. you know, um, because you, it requires a certain mastery. You can't just right. bring a student who's halfway through and be like, all right, go. go is there a difference between getting a black belt as a kid and getting your black belt as an adult? Or is it the same curriculum? Just, you know, learn different. Yeah. Um, I mean, for us, for our school, it was the same. It's the exact same curriculum. Mm. The only difference, um, I don't know if they still do it. I'm pretty sure they do. But the adults, we would give them a set of self-defenses to learn at every belt. So the oh. self-defenses were like really, really practical. Yeah. F like on the street, someone's grabbing your, gra trying to grab your wallet kind of thing. Right. Um, always, we would always preface it with like, these are things you learn. And then if someone pulls a gun on you on the street, probably just give them what they're asking for. Like, <laughs> like there's a, you know, there's a degree of like, you should protect yourself, but you should also protect yourself sometimes by not doing anything. I have been training for this day. Who's <laughs> like, no, we don't, we don't encourage that kind of stuff. Um, but just like, if you happen to be in a situation where someone grabs on you, like you'll have these, these things that you yeah. hopefully be in your memory that, you know, and that's sort of the purpose of a lot of the stuff is to practice it so much that it becomes purely muscle memory. Right. That you don't have to think about it anymore. Yeah. It's reactionary. It's unconscious. Right. But with a degree of execution that happens from practicing it over and over and over. Yeah. And over and over. Yeah. It seems like the forms are, I mean, it's, it seems similar to what we do with Olympic lifting. It's like the burdener every single day. And right. We're trying to connect, you know, a 10 movement sequence into one singular movement, right? So instead of, you know, hip extension, elbows, elbows around, squat, catch the bar, stand up, it's, that all becomes one movement that's a clean or that is, that's a snatch. And it sounds like that's similar to what you're practicing with the forms. Instead mm -hmm. of one punch into a step, like you try to make that one movement. Right. But it's, it's taught in a similar way. Each thing is put, each thing is taught step by step. Yeah. And like for a new student who's learning their first kick, it's not just, here's a kick, do it. Right. It's like, here's how you pick up your leg. Here's where your shoulder should be. This is how tight your core needs to be. Here, we're gonna, we are gonna we have dance bars in the yeah. school. It's a very common thing. Hold on to the dance bar, pick your leg up. All right, now we're just gonna practice like sticking your leg out. Yeah. Okay, now make sure your knee's all the way extended. If someone's knee is still bent, we'll come over, we'll help them adjust right. their leg, all right? You gotta be able to hold your knee out. Your toes need to be down, right. or your toes need to be up, or whatever. Yeah, it just seems like there's a ton of mechanics in, in these, simple quote-unquote movements right. are usually the, the most complex can be can, yeah, be, can yeah. be for some people but um going back to the like kids versus adults oh yeah um a, a, so adults go through the, same, through the same journey it tends to take the same amount of time but adults just have the added thing of being adults and having adult life right. things to take care of so sometimes it can take longer yeah the flip side of that is that often we'll have adults who come in who have already maybe earned a black belt from another school mm. so with them we'll say okay like we recognize that you have a black belt, so we're gonna let you kind of go at your own pace. So you're still paying for classes like anyone else would, but um, instead of, ha like we, we would usually set certain time requirements. Okay, you're a white belt, you have to be a white belt for three months, mm. at least, before you can move on. You can't do it in a month, right. if you're brand new. Yeah, yeah. You know, okay, the next one is another three months, and then right. four months, or whatever. Yeah. But for students who come in with another black belt or something, we're like, all right, you're gonna, you know, we want you to come in for like two weeks, uh, you know, for classes, be consistent, you know, three, four classes a week. And then if you're ready, if you got all the material, just check it out with one of the coaches and he'll, he or she will check you off and then you can move on to the next. Are they allowed to wear, are they allowed to wear the, uh, their belt? Um, you, for our school, usually, yeah. Yeah. If they, if they're really adamant about like, they really feel comfortable wearing the belt and there is a comfort factor that comes in. For sure. With that. Um, yeah, so if if you know, if someone gets their black belt when they're eight and then they start training again when they're fifty. Right. So still Chances I mean I I imagine they'd have to get a new one. I had to do that um when I I got my second degree black belt when I was in end of middle school, I think right before I got into high school. Um 
so I was like 14 or 15. Um, I got my belt then, um, and then I took a break for a while. I came back when I was uh, 19 or 20, and I, I'd grown a bit since then. So all of a sudden, I put on my, my second degree belt, and I was like, oh, <laughs> it's like a little short. Right. Um, so I had to go and order like a new belt and just get some basic embroidery um, yeah. done on it, which is usually pretty cheap. Um, and you can order blank belts from distributors mm. like they're, they're not expensive right. but I did have to get a new belt huh. um, Makes sense. and then I did do some some training at different disciplines and in those schools they were like no you can't mm -hmm. it's too different like, right and we don't want to confuse people if you're wearing a black belt and you're here like training with with new students and you're yeah. learning stuff and I was like all right that's fine so I had to wear a white belt again which right. was weird <laughs> um, but at the same time, you're like, yeah, because I am a new student in this discipline and right. I don't know everything. Yeah, and I would imagine you, you like, with, with all your experience, I would imagine that you pick it up pretty quick mm -hmm. if you go to different disciplines. And that was always the, the fun part for me was when I go to, like, a new school or something and I start training and we do stuff and they'd be like, wow, you learn this really fast. <laughs> well, yeah, I had some yeah. experience. So between, like, from, from when you started martial arts mm. to you mentioned you became a coach at some point at the martial arts studio so while you were just a student what what was your biggest lesson learned or what were some big takeaways what you what you learn about yourself about your life what you learn during that process of being a martial arts student mm. so for our school in particular we had two sort of um uh, dogmas if you will we had the first one which was might for right which is pretty I would say more focused towards kids, uh, more of a kid's thing, and the idea that if you learn how to hit someone, you learn how to take someone out, um, quote unquote, um, you, don't, you don't start fights, you end fights, right? right? If, someone, if someone's bothering you, you don't go up and then sidekick them in the face, because you can, <laughs> although you could, by the time you're a black belt, you definitely could, but it's for self-protection, mm -hmm. right? Um, there may be some ideas that you could apply towards being an adult with those things, but primarily it was focused on kids because yeah. kids have a lot of, you know, uh, antagonistic issues that they have to deal with as kids growing up in schools, getting yeah, bullied sure. or bullying other people or those right. kinds of things. Like you can use these, you can use these skills to protect yourself from getting bullied or you can be the bully. Right. You know? And for me, anyone who's, who's met me in person knows I'm not very tall. And I got bullied a lot when I was younger because I was way shorter than everyone, even then. Right. You know, I, I was even in elementary school, I was way shorter than everyone. Yeah. Um, and I got bullied a lot. And um, my parents always encouraged me to like go hit them, like, go <laughs> right. hit those bullies, they'll leave you alone, yeah. right? But I never, because of what I was doing in the martial arts stuff, I was like, I can't, I can't start a fight. Right. I'm not going to start a fight. Um, but then at some point in high school, I had someone who wanted to tr start some physical violence with me and I hit them pretty hard <laughs> and then that never happened anymore. Yeah. Um, it happened once in, in, a, in a time I was with my dad, we were out working somewhere and there were some other kids around and he, he loves this story, but there was one bigger kid who was bullying me because he didn't want me to play with them, whatever. I, I mean, I was just like very young. Right. Um, and he's like, yeah, you kicked him right in his ass and then he let you play with them, you know? So it's just like, yeah, sometimes you have to kind of take that initiative as a kid. So I, I picked that up as a kid. Um, and that helped me kind of get over that process of like, I'm the small kid who gets picked on all the time. Right. Um, and by the time I was in high school and especially after this one situation, like that was done. Right. That was over. Um, but the bigger one, and the one that I definitely still affects me now, is uh, we would say lead by example. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I think that um, military has very similar sort of. Yeah. For that, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so that that's the one that I you know I still focus on very much is that if you're going to be doing something and you're in a position where you're leading other people, if people are looking at you, you need to be doing the things that you're talking about. Yeah. And if you're not, then you're not leading. Right. Um, and so that was good for the kids um, in the school because as they were growing, gr growing and going through the ranks of belts, we would have them go and help the, the, the occasionally help the classes with the new students. So all of a sudden you have a kid who's been there for three years and now he's starting to teach, he or she's starting to teach the younger kids. Yeah. And it's like, do you remember when you were a white belt, a gold belt? 
And you're like, is this, you want to see, did you remember seeing black belts going around and dancing on their heads and being goofballs? No, they're serious <laughs> business all the time. So you yeah. got to go into that class, you got to be serious. And they'd be like, oh, okay. Right? And then all of a sudden they would start to do that at home and the parents would go like, oh, Billy's being like really good at home all of a sudden. <laughs> what happened? It's like, well, you start talking about that like internal reflection. It's the internal reflection, right? Interesting, yeah. You have to be able to reflect on yourself. So what's that? I mean, I, I get the concept of internal reflection, but like how, what's that look like at martial arts? You just recognize, you recognize when you're, when you're goofing off or when you're slacking or when you're not trying hard and then you just, you just self-correct. Right. You have to self-correct because, yeah. because, um, by the time the kids are black belts and granted, a lot of them are still kids. They're young. Yeah. 10, 11, nine, whatever. Yeah. You know, younger than 15. So they still need a lot of that. Like, Hey. Like today, right? This is not the time to play around right now. Like right. it's time to get focused. Let's do stuff. Yeah. Um, but by and large, a lot of the kids, by the time they get there, they don't need it anymore because they've been, we've been working with them th through so much right. that they realize when, when serious time is, when you yeah. need to focus up and yeah. stop being kids for a second and be this martial arts person. And I remember one of the clearest examples was um, when I been coaching for maybe a year, two years. Right. And I had a, a young girl, her name was Ashley, and I think she was nine. Um, and she had her black belt and she was fierce, like fierce girl, like kicked a lot of butt, worked really hard. Yeah. And then one day I was at the mall for some reason, I don't know what I was doing over there, but I saw her with her dad and she was holding her dad's hand and she had like a pink dress <laughs> and like a bow on awesome. in her hair. And she was like so cute. And I was like, hey, Ashley. And she was just like very cute and shy. And I'm like, who is this girl? Yeah. This is not the girl that I saw in the classroom at all. Yeah. So it's, it become, you, be, you get to be a totally different side of yourself. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think it's it starts off. I would imagine it starts off as you're, you're pretending to be this person, but then over time you learn how to how to become yourself in in the constraints of of that you know discipline of that you know world. Right. So it, it it's a way to sort of explore the side of you that's um, that maybe hasn't been challenged, that hasn't been disciplined, that hasn't been. Um, now serious time, you know, right. and especially as a kid, I would imagine that's a really important world just to, to explore and figure out how to operate in. Because mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the work, that's the workforce, that's you know, a lot of a lot of times in life require that immediate focus and all right, let's solve this problem and right. let's move forward. Right and now's not the time for goofing off. Yeah, that's now's not the time for headstands. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, and and so for myself, it was you know. How do I how do I accomplish the things to the best degree that I can? Right. Because if I have someone, if I have my friends with me and we're working on something, whether it's for school or for something else, like I want them to see what I'm doing and be like, oh yeah, that's that's the way we should be doing things. Yeah. Um, and you know, th so this was back this was back then. This was you know high school, middle school. Yeah, for sure. Then. Um, and it, it didn't always work out like that. It's not like I, I wasn't always the best at everything I did, and I'm not. Uh, by far, right. you know, and I definitely had people where I needed to sit back and let them lead and then observe that and see what the difference is between what they were doing and what I was doing yeah. so that I could hopefully incorporate those things later. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think you can certainly follow by example as well. Right. You know, it's like, regardless, I mean, regardless of whether you're in a leadership position, it's, I mean, you should have integrity with, with the way that you live, mm -hmm. you know, and be open with your struggles and then just try to conquer them and, and get better. Right. I feel like that's that's pretty standard life <laughs> lessons that are really, you know, a lot of a lot of kids don't don't learn because they're not exposed to these challenging things. You know, I I learned a lot of this stuff through swimming. The idea that, you know, you, you have to be there, you have to work hard, you know, show up day in, day out, the grind and quit quit goofing off and playing these stupid games when, when we're trying to train and practice. Right. But I think the difference in there a lot of times is that it comes from an outer, an outward source, an okay. outward form of discipline, right? It comes from the coaching, right? Interesting. They try, they try to instill it in you, but by and large, it's like, you have to show up because we're telling you to show up. Yeah. But for us, it was the other way. We try to put it into the kids. So it's that, it's not, you know, when, when you're on presentation and you're doing a thing at a competition or whatever, right. there's people watching you. So you need to be proper so that when everyone's watching, you go, oh, wow, like, those kids know what they're doing. But 
you need to do it when no one's watching you too. Yeah. Um, and so that is the harder part and not everyone gets there for sure. Oh yeah, for sure. But, um, that, I think that was, that's the separation between like martial arts for kids and a lot of other sports for kids that don't use that, that sort of martial discipline Mm. that you get. Um, you know, if you're playing football, you're there, you know, you're doing football stuff when the coach is watching you or when your parents are watching you maybe, but when you're not there, you know, you're not thinking about it, you know, except for the kids who like love it. If you're, you know, swimming or playing tennis or whatever, it's it's while you're doing the thing and the coaches are encouraging you. And then you have those few kids who really want to go above and beyond. But for most people, it's when the, when you're in that small world and when you're not there, it's it's gone. Yeah. But for martial arts, it's there. For for a lot of people that I've talked to, it's it's the same experience. It's there all the time. It never goes away. And so it just affects everything that you do yeah once you steep yourself in it once you allow yourself to be a part of it wow um is it is it the the discipline that stays or is it the the self the self-awareness the self-awareness too. yeah because it's not that people are watching you and you need to be good because people are watching you. you're watching you yeah so what do you look like to yourself right it's right? your judgment that matters right way more than anybody else's judgment right but then if you're living up to your own degree, and maybe you could call it like a degree, a, a, a similar, not too far a step away from like perfectionism or something like that. But it's not about being perfect. It's just about being like the best that you can. Yeah. To you. Right. Not to anyone else. But because of that, your people can follow you. Because your standard for yourself is higher. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so, so during your time as a student in martial arts, you sort of, you created... You learn how to create high standards and, and then have the discipline to, to actually achieve those high standards. Yeah, and I, I hit a low point too, like a lot of kids, because I did it for a pretty long time. I did it from when I was like seven or eight until the time I was 15 or 16. Yeah. So like better part of 10 years. Um, and I was in, I remember very, very clearly, because we did testing cycles for black belt. So once you got to the black belt level... Um, our owner, the coach, would come and usually take you on like a individualized training program with the other kids who might be uh, candidates for getting black belts. So you got this really hyper-focused training with, with her. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about Arlene here in a bit. Um, and so training with her was super intense, way more intensive than regular classes. And uh, during the time when I was getting when I was in the cycle for my second degree, I was kind of done with it. I was kind of like over at that point because I was 14 and yeah. it was like, <laughs> like a lot of 14 year olds. Right. Um, and I, I just, I was just going in and I was half-assing every practice and every workout and everything. And then, you know, she pulled me to the side and we had like a, a long chat and it was just like, why are you here? What are you doing? Yeah. Is this what you want? Is this what you want? Then you can't do what you're doing. You've right. got to fix it. We have to fix this. We have to change something. And then af- immediately after that conversation, the next day I was back. Like I was like, let's go. I want to do this. You know, she was able to kind of rekindle that just by like getting me to focus on myself again. Mm. Where at that time I was 14 and thinking about my friends and going out and meeting and getting a girlfriend and all those other things yeah. that 14 year olds think about. I wasn't thinking about what I should be doing for myself, right. which was being in that process. Which was training. Well, but yeah, Discipline. but it was, but it was, <laughs> and, and also because my parents were paying a lot of money for me yeah. to do it. But um, she didn't want to see because she, like I said before, I was I had really high aptitude for it. Right. She didn't want to see me waste it because I was an angsty fourteen year old yeah. who didn't care about anything anymore. Yeah. She wanted to see me do well, and then and then during that test, I got an outstanding as well. Mm. Because, but I wouldn't have if if she hadn't pulled me aside and reminded me. Yeah. Of those things. Right. Yeah, I think that's the power of a of a good coach is they they're really good at at pulling things out of you that or they have a, they're good at reminding you of what you really want, right. right? You know, they're not they're not tricking you, they're not they're not doing anything, but all the good coaches I've had in my life they they continuously and constantly just pull like pull greatness out of me, you know, and a lot of times they're so good at it that you don't like you didn't believe that there was greatness in there. Right. And then despite your not believing, they still, you know, found found what was good in you and, and pulled it out. Yeah. 
and then they, they serve as just a constant reminder and a constant reason to you know, keep pushing and keep going. And, and I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this idea of you know, external versus internal uh, motivation or realization. And I'm, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think if swimming, like how, how that works in swimming. And, and I think you're probably right because we never really talked about the idea of just being internally driven. It was more... You show up to practice and you work hard. Right. Because the coach is there telling you to work hard. And if the coach wasn't there, then we all slacked off real bad. Right. Um, but the swimmers who, who did real good... Were internally motivated, <laughs> yeah. but that was more natural. Right, yeah. that wasn't instilled by the coach. It wasn't something. Probably. Yeah, it wasn't taught as part of the sport, as part of the curriculum. This concept of you need to be internally motivated. Right. You can't depend on me being here to drive you. Right, and I'm sure there are coaches that do that because they've seen how that works and they've learned about it, so they're able to bring. It. Maybe they did martial arts or something. Yeah. But or they've learned about it now, especially with you know in the information age and all that other stuff. You know, mixing right. of mixing of coaching disciplines, yeah. um, how that affects, especially kids. Right? Yeah, for coaching kids. Yeah, I think kids. I mean, once once I got into high school, I started to realize that you know it's it's up to me how hard I work. It's, it's completely up to me, and I can work hard and I can get my goals, or I can kind of slack off and kind of phone it in and, and work just hard enough right. to not be called out by the coach. Right. But you know, there's a there's a fine line between going ninety percent and going a hundred percent in a practice. Ninety percent's not going to get you yelled at. Be like, oh, just had an off day. Right. Good, good practice, not great. Um, if you phone it in, then you're gonna get a yell at. <laughs> yeah, but not, like in our small world, like ninety percent would get you yelled at. Like you, you get pulled aside and be like, "What's going on?" Because mm -hmm. you could tell when a kid wasn't, when a student, even even a girl, right. wasn't. If they normally had a level they could perform at, and all of a sudden they're not for some reason, and it's yeah. very visible. Right. And you can be like, "What's happening?" If they're having an off day because of their mom or their school or whatever, and you're like, "Okay, fine." But if it's no reason, it's like, well, why? Yeah. Why not? Why aren't you practicing to the level that you were yesterday? Yeah, that makes sense. If there's no reason for it, then it's like, all right, there's no reason for it, so fix it. Yeah. Let's go. So as you as you were transitioning into a coach and you started coaching, what, at 15, 16? Um, well, we, we, we do some student teaching yeah. material as part of the black belt requirement. Mm. Um, so, but it's like very limited. It's like right. you, you're pretty much just a body and you're there to like demo the movements right. to the younger kids. When did you but, start getting paid? Yeah, that was, I was when I was 19. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. So I, was, I was much older. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And so, um, how did Taekwondo change for you when you transitioned? I mean, I, I would imagine that you were still practicing and that you're still very much a student when you're, when you're also a teacher, but did it, did it change at all what you got out of it and yeah. what it meant to you? Yeah, 100%. Um, so actually, so like I had said earlier, like I got my second degree black belt right when I entered high school, and then I took a break because I was done. Uh, I was mentally and emotionally just kind of done with it at that point. Yeah. And I did, I did Olympic wrestling for a while. Oh, cool. I did track and field for a while. I did swim for a while. Yeah. Um, I did long distance, uh, what is it called? Um, Cross country. Cross country. Yeah, yeah, I did cross country for a bit, which I don't know why, because I have short legs and it's a terrible sport. For me. <laughs> I did it anyway because I don't know. Um, so I like I, I did some other stuff. Yeah. Um, probably the wrestling I got the most out of, um, like in a physicality sense, because right. it's such a good mix with the the stand up fighting and then the the you know the ground fighting yeah. stuff, and the approaches are similar. But once I got older and I was coaching, I I hadn't done any martial arts for four and a half years maybe that chunk where I just hadn't done anything I hadn't even thought about it um, but then I was kind of looking for work and I was like oh, maybe I could go work there I don't know and they thankfully they needed coaches they yeah. were at a point where they needed so it was like all right we'll come in let's go through all the stuff all the old material again you know we'll shotgun it yeah. over a week you yeah. know and anything that you're kind of hazy on like we'll kind of we'll fix it as we're going um, and then when I started I was just it was such a weird shift because my coach, his name is uh, Robert Barra, we call him Mr. B, um, was still there, still working. Wow. Um, he's a he's a six foot three guy from Chicago, very smiley, very funny, loves working with kids, um, and and was very motivated, you know, in the martial arts world. Um, and him and his cousin Arlene, who's the owner, had been training martial arts together since they were like four. Yeah. Um, 
and um, Arlene, just to speak with her, Ar Arlene Lemus was the owner in my coat, you know, that the owner of the school. Yeah. And she's a gold medalist in Taekwondo fighting. Wow. Um, she got her gold medal in 88. So that was in Seoul, Korea. She beat a Korean woman in the Korean sport of Taekwondo fighting and won the gold for the United States. USA. Yeah. Yeah. USA. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's can't, incredible. Can't, can't get any better than that, you know. Wow. And, and so she taught... Like she was your, she was your teacher growing up. So very often she didn't coach the regular classes. When right. the school very very first started, she did. Right. But Mr. B was sort of the oh, head. Okay. He was the head coach. He was the one who was in there. Arlene was doing a lot of the office stuff because there's a lot of office work, sure, sure. Hand, handling all the accounts and all that kind of stuff. So she did a lot of that. But she would come out during like the testing times and during the black belt yeah. cycles, and that's when you got like really focused attention. So a lot of the discipline stuff came from her Olympic style of training, comes from that side. Interesting. Um, but um, once I was working there, all of a sudden, like, Mr. B was my coworker. Yeah. And it, it was hard to kind of, it was this really hard, like, cognitive dissonant moment of, like, whoa, everything has changed. Yeah. Um, and I spent the first six months just kind of shadowing him. Right. And not really taking my own groups of students. Maybe I get one or two. Um, and just kind of trying to find my own voice. Because you have to have a voice as a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, and everyone approaches it differently. Everyone's personality is very different. Um, working with kids is a little easier because there's less demand from them. But you still have to know what you're talking about. Right. Um, you can't do the things wrong and then go, oh, here you go. They're wrong. I don't know. Um, yeah. You have to be competent. But um, it was weird because I didn't know how to talk to them yep. as an adult person now um and so i struggled with that for a while but i'll, I'll <laughs> they'll probably laugh really hard if i tell this story with if they were here but i remember one day we were just hanging out i think it was after a graduation graduations we did saturday morning parents would come the kids would get new belts we'd eat some food and then they'd go home yeah and so we were just staying after to like clean up and talk about stuff and um I don't know, they were having a conversation about a party or going to a parties or something. And Arlene said something, something, something. Yeah, because it's like playing Naked Jello Twister or something. And it just, it was really weird and out of nowhere. And I had never heard them speak this way. Right. And I was just, I was in tears laughing. <laughs> and at that moment, I was just like, wow, like, yeah, I'm not the kid that they're like needing to keep at an arm's length right. between the teacher and the student. Like... I'm here, we can talk about adult stuff. They're my friends now. Yeah. They're also still kind of my bosses, but also like we can talk and be relaxed yeah. and kind of be jovial about it. You're on the other side of the dojo. Right, yeah, the other side of the mirror, um, the training mirror. So, so it was that, that moment, like I, I felt like I was part of the, the, the working coach community yeah. at that point. Yeah. Um, but it took a while to get there. Yeah. And then um, the, the interesting thing that happened, and I've talked to other coaches about this, is that when you start talking about it all the time, you start realizing all the things that you do wrong, and then you start fixing them internally. Mm, yeah. Um, to, to teach us to learn twice. No, seriously. Yeah, that's, <laughs> but yeah, there's a reason why like people say those kinds of sayings right. are, right? Like, teaching is learning, because you're learning about yourself. Yeah. And you're, so you're like, oh yeah, I always put my foot like in this weird position. I need to make sure that it's here, because that's what I say to all the kids. And I, we do that, I think, a lot in CrossFit um, at times. We're like, oh, you know, we're going to move the barbell like this way. And then everyone looks at you and goes, you didn't do what you just said. And you go, oh, shit, right, okay, I need yeah. to fix that. Right. Yeah, I mean, you do. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> just going to keep doing it. Don't, don't do it like me. <laughs> oh, man. All right, cool. So once you were sort of on the other side of the mirror, did, did, did your relationship with the sport change? Did you... Did you, did you get better? Did it reinvigorate you? Or did you just kind of, was it now work and, mm -hmm. and a chore? How, how'd that change? Um, I definitely, I would say I got better at it then. I mean, part of it was coming, you know, very often they say, you know, adult males kind of come into their 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 body in their 20s, right? right. Like, like 18, 19, 20, like you, you really do, a lot of your growing is kind of done. Right. But like the connection between your mind and what your body can now do happens through those like so yeah. even some people say i think it's like 25 onwards wow. depending i mean i think you know obviously you have your high tier athletes who do really well in their early 20s but um yeah i i definitely got better i got yeah. i got way more technical 
and I was able to execute things with with a lot more like I always did it when I was a kid but I wasn't ever thinking about what I was doing it was very unconscious yeah I just executed things and I was just like oh it's it's like this and then everybody like wow that was good that was amazing and I was just like oh, I'm I'm just doing what feels natural right but once I was coaching and I was very conscientious about what I was doing it was on such a different level mm-hmm. Um, and I felt like I kind of owned the thing I was doing then as opposed to like, well, I just do it because I'm not thinking about it. Right. So I really was able to own all, and I did competitions as an adult, um, not a lot, but I did a bunch. And again, it was, it was the same thing. Like I was beating out people who I would do, I would do a weapons form with like a bow staff, you know, Sean and I's favorite (laughs) spin PVC. Um, and I would beat out competitors who came from schools where they only trained with weapons. That's all they did. Oh. But I would beat them. Because you had a deeper foundation. Maybe they weren't coaches. Maybe they never coached. They were just students. Yeah. And it's not like they were kids. They were adults. You know, right. I wasn't beating out nine-year-olds. Like, yeah! No, yeah. these are other adult competitors who right. trained very hard and very seriously. Yeah. And I was still able to, to, you know, and it's not like, these are small tournaments. These aren't like nationally sure. run things. But still, so. I mean... But it felt good, you know, it felt kind of good to be like, I still have, I still got it, you know, I still yeah. got it. Um, That's cool. And I got, be- and I was able to get better, and I had a, a, a co-worker, her name is Stephanie, and we go by nicknames a lot in the gym, so her nickname was Tiki, um, and we would train together all the time. Yeah. We would train to get, we would stay late, and we would train. We would come in early, and we would train, because it was fun for us. Yeah. It was fun to do, and we would, we would push each other to constantly get better. Right. Um, so yeah, so through that and through the little competitions we would do, and we had a little small comp- tournament team within the school, kids who showed high proficiency, we would invite them and their families to like be part of the tournament team. And so we would go to the tournaments around the area and mm. drive up and drive down. Um, and oftentimes we were judging, but then oftentimes we had room to compete. And a lot of times the parents, um, would work with us but not really understand where we were coming from as coaches and then they would see us compete and then they would go like wow like please teach my son or daughter or both you know please can you teach them to like do what you were just doing yeah and it's like yeah but it takes time right were they were they blown away by the by like the physical aspects of it or like the the demonstration of what taekwondo looks like at a high level oh yeah or were they more impressed with some sort of like mental approach or um, I mean, I don't know if they could see the, it, it's hard to relay like what's going on in your head when you're doing like a competitive yeah. thing, but, um, definitely like if I was, cause I did forms, I tended to go towards forms more than mm-hmm. the fighting. Um, and yeah, if you executed a form and, and you were really crisp and you, you know, you did things, um, to a very high level, it's clear, right? it's obvious. Um, and there are kids who can do it, definitely. But For a lot sure. of times, that's a very natural talent. It's hard to teach that to a six or a seven year old. Mm. But there are definitely little younger kids, I won't say little kids, but younger kids who can do it just as well as an adult can. Yeah. Um, and there are adults who never quite break that, break through that little barrier. Um, and that could just be, that could be a failing of coaching, or that could just be that person's individual personality just isn't able to push through right. um, and achieve that that higher level of execution. What was your mental preparation like when you were, when you were doing these? Um, not that different from uh, competitive weightlifters. You know, you ask a lot of competitive weightlifters, like, how did you do that lift? And they just, like, visualization. I just go through it in my head over and over and over and yeah. over and over again. And that's what you do. If, you, if you're, uh, I would say people who are on the competitive circuit or whatever are probably thinking about, if, if they're doing forms, let's say, they're probably thinking about their forms most of the day. Mm. And probably as they're trying to go to sleep and right when they wake up. Yeah. And any time where they're not having to think about other things in their life, they're probably thinking about that. Right. They're probably running through the routine. Um, and wow. right before you go up, especially, that's the only thing you're thinking about. Right. There's nothing else there's nothing else to think about. You can watch other people and go, Wow, that person's good. Oh, they did that kick really well. But why? Right, that doesn't affect you. Right. What do you get from that? Nothing. Because mm. it's not about what the other people are doing. Oh, I gotta try to do better than her. Wow, she can hold her her leg up for twenty seconds straight. Okay, great. Right. I'm gonna do my thing. Yeah. And I got to make sure that it's the best that I can do it. Yeah, I think that's a really I think that's a really valuable point. Just the idea that you can only control your actions 
And so don't don't be distracted by other people's actions. Yeah. I think that's I think that's extremely valuable. And I think that's part of what I liked about CrossFit more than other like because you know I tried going to the Gold's Gym and stuff like that for a while, but it it does seem very by and large, and I think that's people would admit it's their own fault for ha- this happens, but you pay attention to everyone else yeah. while you're there, right? Oh, what's he doing? Oh, what's she doing? Uh, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing more weight. Right, right. <laughs> and everyone, I think everyone tends to go there yeah. unconsciously or not. Um, but CrossFit, you know, instilled that idea of me versus me. Right. And that's what, that's what the focus is. And it was just like, yes, I relate to that. Right. Because that's what I've been doing. Yeah. forever exactly so so that's what le- that's what i enjoyed about it because it was lifting and physicality not to be better than someone else to be better than yourself right so yeah it immediately was like that same connection for me yeah yeah no i i think that i think that idea of i mean as a swimmer that's always been i mean that's just what that's just what we do you know like there sure there's eight lanes in a pool and yeah at some at some level, the person next to you you know affects your race because pacing and you know all the different all the different things. At the end of the day, you want to beat people. Right. <laughs> you want to finish first, and right. so there is some racing component to it. Right. And I really enjoyed that aspect of things. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're racing a clock, mm-hmm. and it's your time. Right. That's really what the that's really what the race is about. Right. It's about beating the time. Yeah. So you would you would kind of. So you visualize. I want to dive a little deeper into how you visualize. Because a a lot of people, you know, I I remember doing mental training when I was swimming. And the coach would be like, visualize your race. And I would just roll my eyes and I'd close my eyes and (laughs) go to sleep. Because that's ridiculous. No way thinking is going to make me a better swimmer. Um, Newsflash, it's probably the most important thing that you can do. Right. Quick tangent. There was a study. Uh, I gotta find this study because I've I've have cited it a hundred times, <laughs> and now it's getting to the point where I'm like questioning whether or not to, whether or not this is true. But I'm like ninety nine percent sure this is true. Right. I'm gonna find the study after this. Podcast, I'm gonna find the study. I'm gonna link, link in the description. Link in show notes. But there was a study. Now I'm not gonna be able to find the study. <laughs> <laughs> and then ninety nine percent of all studies are made up. Right. Anyway, there was a study that had a group a control group of people. Uh, some showed up, they, they all did a benchmark workout test, three minutes on a bicycle, something like that. And then a group did nothing for three weeks, a group trained three times a week for three weeks, and then a group showed up and just visualized training. And the group that trained got whatever, 100% of the you know, quote unquote results. The group that did nothing got 0% of the results. And the group that showed up and visualized the training got 30% of the results. Mm. And so just visualizing training gets you more fit, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start selling them. <laughs> visualization, a, a visualization, guy. Guy. visualization guy. We're just gonna put little little bleachers, yeah. and you know, it'll be thirty percent of regular gym membership because <laughs> you get thirty percent of the results, and you show up, guaranteed no injuries, right? Right? You can't visualize an injury and have that injury happen. That's right. <laughs> it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be. No one else is doing it. <laughs> That's right. No one else is doing it for a reason. We're gonna make so much money. <laughs> Or none. <laughs> we visualize the money, maybe it'll. So how, you know, walk me through that visualization process. Um, I mean, you have to go through the. If we're talking like a, a forms routine, you have to go through the routine, you know, in its entirety. Yeah. But usually there might be like one or two spots that are like tricky for whatever yeah. reason, either because of execution or landing or transitioning from one move to another. So maybe you're you're going through that spot. Okay, make sure. Make sure your make sure your hips are back. Make sure your feet are there. Make sure you catch it. Are you the landing this way? Seat, are you seated? Are you seated? Are you seated? Eyes closed. Are you like kind of meditating almost? Um, I mean, we're talking like yeah. the the fifteen minutes right before. Right. I'm sure most people are different. Um, I think for me, I would usually have my eyes closed. That helps. Yeah. If your eyes are open, there's just too much input. Are so, you standing and kind of imagining the positioning? Um. I would do that for sure. Um, if if they let, sometimes you have to be seated. Right. Um, but like, especially if you're like the next one up, like you're up and you're you're kind of. You'll see if you watch any like competition, you'll see people off to the side like doing these like little shoulder shrugging yeah. things because they're going through the the routine in their head. Right. 
but just giving that little bit of execution. Yeah. I mean, my favorite part of the Winter Olympics is the bobsled drivers that yeah. are just sitting there because they know every single turn. Same thing. And they're visualizing the, the whole race. Right, same thing. Yeah. yeah I'm bummed I'm going to miss most of that because I'm going to be away. Yeah. And so I'm not going to be able to watch too What's much. What's your favorite time. Olympic sport winner? Winner Olympic sport? Yeah. Oh, curling for sure. Curling? Curling. Yeah. I bought... it's, it's, a, it's, it's so unusual and unique. Yeah. Yeah. I bought Nagano Winter Olympics 1996, or I, I got it. I don't know if I bought it. Mm. I, I convinced my parents to buy it for me mm. for the Nintendo 64 just so I could play curling. curling. <laughs> and I like I like the idea of this, the speed skating as a competition, too. I think yeah. that's a really interesting sport. Yeah. It's very, I think it's very unique in that scope yeah. of things. So. Yeah, I like the speed skating. I like I like all of the, the bobsled, the luge, the skeleton. Yeah. Yeah. That's scary. That stuff's crazy. I went bobsledding once in Lake Placid. How'd that go? It was like 13 seconds. We drove through a giant snowstorm. Yeah. And it was like a three hour drive. We got to Lake Placid and, you know, we signed all the waivers. We got, we got excited. They put our helmets on. They put us in a little truck. And you see the track that goes all the way to the top. Right. You're like, this is going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. And then right as the truck starts, it moves just about three feet up the mountain and then you get out and they're like yep wow. we're gonna start right here <laughs> Done. <laughs> literally like a few turns right. and that's the end right. you're like oh right so first i was a little disappointing and i was like this is gonna suck we're not gonna get any speed but whatever like yeah, i'll enjoy it and then they load us in the bobsled i had envisioned just like in the olympics we're gonna sprint we're gonna jump in you know, pull in the handles, tuck our heads. Right. No, that's not how it works either. You just get in and they push you. Right? You just get in and they kind of like nudge you. Just, just dink. Right. I was like, oh, this is going to be so lame. <laughs> so lame. And so we, we go and then basically once, like right after they nudge you, that was the craziest roller coaster I've ever been on. Yeah. I mean, it was going so fast. Right. It was incredible. Because there's no friction. It was insane. And you see the turn. Well, first it was snowing and we didn't have goggles. And no. so the <laughs> snow was kind of pelting you in your eyes. And right. I was like, I cannot close my eyes for this. Right. And you go into the turn and you le legitimately feel like you're going to slingshot out of this entire contraption. And you're just going to be a little bobsled missile going through, through the air right. to your death. Right. And you whip through that first turn and then it's like, whoa. And it's a feeling. It's, it's crazy. It's yeah. a feeling... You just the momentum transfer it's and then the next turn is there it's literally there before you even realize the turn that you just did was over mm -hmm. and then i mean 13 seconds and the whole ride was done right and my my heart was beating super fast yeah. for about two hours right. it was so awesome right it's adrenaline it was crazy yeah yeah i man I still wish they would have taken us from the top <laughs> you should go back there. and i still want to do the run and jump but i can't imagine I can't imagine doing a luge or something. Or you just, right, that's just crazy. you and nothing else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've never been bobsledding, but they used to have a bobsled ride at, at King's Dominion back mm. in the 90s. Mm -hmm. That was pretty slow, I think. Like, <laughs> thinking back, I mean, it was a while ago. But anyone who went to King's Dominion in the like late 90s probably probably knows what I'm talking about. It was like a bobsled ride like way in the back of the park. Um, it was like, I don't think this is like real bobsledding at all. Right. So. They're totally different. But they had like little tubes and you're like, oh, it's <laughs> a corner and it, I mean, it's no, way. No, it wasn't very fast. Can't beat the real thing. Right. Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics, if you have to pick? Oh, Summer Olympics for sure. For sure. Yeah, there's just, there's just more going on. Yeah. Um, and, and they're bringing more stuff in on the same, in the same note, uh, 2020, which is going to be in Tokyo. Yeah. They're bringing Japanese fighting in for the very first time. Really? They're bringing Japanese fighting into the Olympics when it's in Tokyo. So it's like a huge deal. Is it the Kempo stuff? Um, not Kempo. It's traditional Shotokan. What's, uh, what's the difference? Kempo is... Oh, Shot a, Shotokan karate? Yeah. Okay. So, Kempo's the sword, right? No, no, no. That's Kendo. That's Kendo. Kendo is with the sword. What's Kempo? Kempo is, uh, it's a lot like judo uh, kempo is korean style judo oh. so kempo or there's kempo kickboxing which is this whole like americanized western mixed right. stuff but kempo itself is uh korean style uh wrist locks and throws and spins mm. and things like that i did that when i was living in south Got korea it. okay um which was really exciting and the the master the owner there was also big into tkd 
So we would do like an hour of training of Kempo and then he'd bust out his kicking pads and then we'd like kick pads for another half an hour or something because he liked doing that. But he yeah. didn't have anyone to do that with. Right. You need another body. You need another human to, right. to be able to move around and do stuff. Huh. So we would stay and he would teach me some, some unusual technical stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but they're bringing the, the Shotokan um, or the traditional karate competitive fighting is very, very different from TKD. Um, so yeah, I guess we can we can talk about this uh, yeah. TKD at an Olympic fighting level. There are I don't think there's any TKD uh, forms in the Olympics. Uh, it's just the fighting aspect. Right. There are high level competitive forms, but it's not Olympic. Right. Um, so if you want to go to the Olympics and do TKD, you have to fight. Right. Um, so the fighting there is very very specific. Um, anyone who's ever watched the competition, um, it's uh, only kicking. There you can't punch your opponent. There's no scoring for punches, huh. but it's score based, so it's kind of like boxing. You can win by score, you can win by knockout. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of movement. Um, you know, there's uh, two minute rounds or three minute rounds. It might be three minute rounds. Um, never done Olympic style fighting, so so sorry if I get the exact details wrong. Right. But um, it's two points for a body kick, three points for a head kick. Um, so you know you want to go for the head kicks if you can because right. you get more points, but it's harder. Yeah. Um, but you can just win by a knockout, which does happen too. Wow. Um, but you can you have to hit with certain moves, certain kicks. They can't be kicks with intent to injure. Um, so like I can't be trying to kick you straight in your face to hopefully make it so you can't see. Mm. Um, but if I kick you with a, a clean kick in your head. And then you get knocked out, like that's that's clean, right. right? But if I take my foot and I catch it on the back of your head and drag your face all the way into the ground, that's like a malicious maneuver. Right? Interesting. Yeah. Um, so there's there's some there's some rules and stipulations in there. Why can't you punch? Um, is it safety or is it just that's not? I think it's just the style. Yeah, that's yeah. just how it developed over time in our little school in right. our world and in the, the the american local competitive circuit you can punch and you Got can it. get points for punch yeah po uh, points for punching but a lot of times what happens and this is sort of the issue with with refereeing in almost any sport um a lot of times especially uh, this was my issue fighting guys taller than me which was almost always the case they could do this sort of reach out boop on the top of the head that's not re it's not a punch right right it's not a discipline the, like the punch has to have like a, a turn and a snap and some right. velocity. A lot of times you get the head boop, and the head boop, the head boop, and and referees would call that a point. That's and ridiculous. yeah, because because the 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 glove makes contact with the top of the pad yeah. on the head. So yeah, you made contact. That's a point. But there's really there's no technicality to it. Yeah. Um. So that we would take a lot of issue with with um the 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 head boop, um, <laughs> and that's I think why like hands kind of transitioned out of. Interesting. That. But that being said, um, with the Japanese style, you can punch. Uh, it has to be a like a straight chest punch, or it has to be like straight to the top of the headgear punch. Mm. But they're very technical. So the punch, you have to be in a certain depth with your stance, and your hands have to be in a certain position, and you have to just make enough contact, and it has to come all the way back, and you have to be back in like your starting position for it to count. If you punch and like twist through, that's a malicious punch. If you if you punch and there's no snap, if it just kind of falls down, that's not enough technique. It doesn't count. Interesting. The, the judges won't won't call it. As yeah, important. it's almost like it's almost like that. It's, it's like fighting. Yeah, it's not even really fighting. It's, it's you're just playing a sport with with a lot of different rules. It right. seems. There's a lot of rules, um, but you're trying to do it. You're trying to execute it better and faster than the other person right. who's in front of you. Right. And your only your only uh, roadblock to getting that win is overcoming the other person's movement and making sure that you out move them right right so there is that sort of dueling competitive uh, yeah. aspect to it and uh it's funny coming from tkd and I, I was able to do some shotokan when i lived in japan and the because i had pretty good aptitude for movement and fighting everything um the this was while i was an international student so they let me on their collegiate team for a short stint and i got to go to a couple other schools in Japan and compete right. um, and they did it sort of team style so you had rounds and the teams got collective points based on if you win or lost and I got pretty frustrated <clears throat> in some of the competitions because I would 
uh, Japanese style doesn't do any spinning movements. Yeah. For the most part, it's very straight line. Yeah. So I would bring in like a spin movement and I would connect, uh, and then they wouldn't call the point, and I'd just be like, "The fuck!" Like that was a that was a clean kick. Like right. it was nice. Um, Doesn't count with the. Spin. But it wouldn't count because they just they didn't know what to do with it because they're just like, oh, "This is not we don't use these." Right. Um, and then like my friends kind of helped me out and I got a little better. And when I came back and I talked to Arlene, to Miss Lemus about it, and she, through her Olympic stuff, she trained for a little while in Japan and she had the exact same experience. And she told me the story um, that I'll never ever forget. She's like, yeah, I was there. I was in a competition. This was an active tournament. And I just threw like a round kick, which is just you turn your hips and you kind of, you're trying to hit with the instep of your foot okay. against someone's chest. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, I hit them. And because we tend to follow through a little bit more than they do. So like, she's like, I hit him and I, you know, I kind of came back, but you know, it wasn't like the Japanese, full Japanese way to do it. So they didn't call the point. So she's like, I shrugged my shoulders and I kicked him again. They didn't call the point. So I kicked him harder. They still didn't call the point. So I kicked him again and it was harder that time. And eventually he like doubled down and pain and then they called the point. And I was like, all right, okay. So I'm just going to do this until they call points. Um, and it's just that difference in style. Yeah. That's really interesting. What do you think about the UFC? Mm. When it got started, I thought it was really exciting. Yeah. You know, back in its early early days, which was what, like 99, 2000, yeah, 2001, something like that, right? I think. Very early on, I was like, wow, that's going to be so cool. You're going to have a boxer versus a TKD versus a whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so, and that was like, cool. Because that's what every fighter, I think, kind of thinks about in their head eventually. Who's going to win? Right. Who's going to win if you take these very distinct disciplines right. and have them fight each other, which right. doesn't get to happen often. Yeah. Now it's not that. I think anyone who watches it knows it's not that. Yeah, it's, it's its own discipline, its own sport. Because Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu ended up, once it came into the scene in 2002 or three, it was clear that it was very dominant. Because people hadn't really seen it in a in a public setting before like that. Um, because if you're a stand up fighter, if we say like TKD is a stand up fighting right. style, right? You're standing up, you're throwing punches and kicks. There's not a whole lot to do from the ground, right? Or someone grabs you. There's not a whole lot of of movement there that right. that you work with. Um, so once people started doing a lot of captures and holds. It was like, well, I need to learn other captures and holds to defend myself from this fighting style because yeah. I don't have it in my discipline. So that's when like BJJ kind of got started mixing into everything. And so now you see primarily, um, you know, everyone is like BJJ and some something else. Right? Yeah. And there's still a couple of good stand-up fighters. I know there was a Japanese guy. I think he was a Japanese and Mexican or from Spain um, who was uh, TKD. And he was doing really well in the circuit yeah. a few years ago. Interesting. Um, I think Machida, I think, was his last name. That sounds about right. Um, and he he was like he was getting a lot of prominence for knocking people out from the stand up position. Oh yeah, right. Um, yeah, so. I mean, there's definitely. I mean, it's it's really interesting to me because I, I I completely agree that early on it was really exciting just to just to watch a, a sumo wrestler fight. You know, somebody and what's going to happen? Yeah. yeah, what's going to happen when this guy just lays on him? Mm. You know, is that is that it? Right. It's really interesting, but then, you know, I think, sort of to your point with Taekwondo, it being, you know, a stand-up only, so what happens when the fight goes to the ground? Right. So, your your knowledge of the stand-up is super complete, right. but your knowledge of all possible scenarios in a fight is not complete. Right. And, and so I think the, the UFC sort of just evolved into, you could probably even say MMA is the art of, like, of street fighting. <laughs> you know, because that's kind of what it all comes down to. You got to be able to box, but if if you get taken down, you know, you got to know what to do in right. that scenario too. Right. Which is why, but like by and large, like I don't like calling it mixed martial arts per se. It's now its own yeah. thing. It really is. Like right. it, I think it needs a new name for sure. Um, street fighting. Sure. <laughs> cage fighting. Real straight. Yeah. I mean, I think cage fighting has been like a, a discipline for a while. Yeah. Even before like UFC kind of got off the ground. But I think it does need its own name because yes, there is still a mixing of martial arts, but like that's what Bruce Lee style was. It was a mixing of martial arts. Right. It didn't involve uh, captures and holds. 
I think, uh, for the most part, but that he created it and then gave it a name, and right. this is my thing, right? This is Jeet Kune Do. Um, so I think I think now it's it has enough, and maybe maybe it won't. Maybe people just like you know calling it MMA, and so that's what it'll be forever. But clearly, like there are MMA gyms who teach you that style of fighting for because sure. it's it's stand up and on the ground. But that's uh, I'm sure people are very familiar with uh, like a fighter like Ronda Rousey, yeah. who had a lot of fame. For being it's a good Rousey. F- Rousey? I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Rhonda, if you're listening. That's right. You don't want her kicking your ass. Yeah. Um, but she was great ground fighter. But if you ever, like, I would watch her throw punches, and they were terrible. Yeah. And she had very bad, like, internal rotation on her punches. She wasn't able to keep tension. Mm-hmm. And that's why when the uh, the the famous fight from a year or two ago when she got knocked out in like the Holly home yeah right in like two seconds yeah. because Holly was a stand up fighter and a boxer and right. came at her with punches and boom you don't know how to move around it you don't know how to how to throw punches right. back at someone like that yeah for sure so that's that's where stand up fighting has the advantage oh yeah I mean yeah especially in, in the UFC what's what's really interesting is you see you see these fighters let's say that there's a you know a boxer who's fighting you know a wrestler or whatever and the boxer knows that if it goes to the ground, he's kind of screwed. Right. And so he, in his camp or wherever, when when he's preparing for the fight, he's practicing just how to stop the takedown, mm-hmm. right? And he's putting a ton of focus in how to stop the takedown. So right. if I if you can't take me down to the ground, then it's going to stay on its feet, and I, I have an advantage there. Right. And the wrestler is obviously really good at taking people to the ground, so right. it might go to the ground. Right. And it's just that 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 dynamic to me is really fascinating. I. I person I think the UFC is really fun to watch, but I completely agree with you that it is no longer. Yeah, I mean, mixed martial arts. Occasionally, you still see it. Yeah, and maybe mixed martial arts is the right term. Maybe it's not the right term because it's still very much. I mean, basically, what is it? What is it? What is it turned into? It's turned into uh, wrestling, jujitsu, muay thai, uh, boxing, and kickboxing. Yeah. Right. So it's like those four. It's primarily, I think, most people would train in those four styles right. to be a competitive MMA fighter. For sure. You need to have those four things. But then you see the people who have the Taekwondo background and they just the crazy kicks that they're coming up with, and right. it's just unexpected enough. And having that, having that, uh, um, in, your know, in, yeah, in your wheelhouse. Yeah. In your Rolodex, yeah. then that's that's only gonna make you a better fighter. Right. That's what's that's what's really interesting to me is just where, like at the end of the day, it's 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 kind of I think Joe Rogan describes it as um, as extreme, uh, what is it? Extreme problem solving with dire consequences or something. <laughs> okay. And it's you know, uh, yeah, I mean that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because every time you move, it changes the the situation, it changes the dynamic, and yeah, I mean you. You'll see kicks that that I that I don't even comprehend. Right. And before I know it, you snap my head off my body, yeah. and I'm laying on the ground, <laughs> crying. <laughs> <laughs> Just one move. Just one move. That's cool. So, um, how'd you end up in Korea? So you 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 were coaching. You were coaching at this at this. Um, Taekwondo gym, mm-hmm. and then you just moved to Korea? Um, no, no, it didn't really happen like that. Um, I, I coached there for almost a decade. Oh, wow. Well, it was more like seven, six, seven years. Right. Because um, from the time I was 19 to the time I basically finished my undergrad. Um, but I had a year where I lived in Japan because I, I, I did a study abroad for a year. Um, and then I came back, I finished my undergrad. Um, and that was 2010, and then right after, I was, since I had been in Japan, I was thinking about going back to Japan. Okay. Um, either for grad school, or just to maybe start going, like, work over there for a bit, and spend some time there, but that was right as 2011 hit, which was when the earthquake, tsunami, big disaster oh, happened. Yeah. So I was like, oh, well, I guess, uh, I guess I'm not going there for a while. And I was actually considering going over there during the rescue effort mm. time, because um, I speak Japanese pretty well. And I was like, oh, I, maybe I can go be an interpreter and like, help some people. Yeah. And, How'd you learn Japanese? Um, I got in, I was interested in, during high school. Yeah. Because um, I got into a lot of like Japanese TV and movies and things like that. Right. And uh, there was no, I didn't have it available through my school because most like most schools on the East Coast, we have like Spanish, German, and, and French, and right. that's, and maybe Latin, um, and that's what you had, right? And there were no other options from that. 
but um, I was like, man, it's like if I get the opportunity to learn Japanese in college, I'm gonna do it. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it. I want to try. And um, so I was as I was uh, working at the dojo, and I was going to a community college. So I was just doing you know kind of part time classes, right. or I guess I was doing full time classes and part time working or something. Yeah. Um, and they had it, but it was uh, almost in D.C. It was in the Alexandria campus or the Annandale campus. But I was just like, oh, it's a 40-minute drive, you know, up 95, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go That's through. That's cool. Um, and I did it, and I started learning it through through the classes, and it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. Legit. Like, still to this day, it's probably one of the hardest things I ever started from nothing yeah. to do. Because, like, you get a textbook, and they're like, hello, welcome to, you know, Japanese 101. Here are the basic reading characters. And then you turn the page, and then there's no more English. Oh. And it's all just the characters from that yeah. point. I'm just like, fuck, I have to really, I got to go learn this stuff yeah. so I can do the rest of this class. Right. And, you know, the teacher's like, if you don't learn these things by next week, like, you're not going to be able to do the class anymore. So go learn them. Wow. We're having a test next week. That's um, crazy, cause yeah, cause in, if you're learning Spanish and all the you know languages like that, you're still using the same alphabet. You it's can just, read it on the board. Yeah, yeah. You just have to learn how to pronounce it, and even then, most people don't. Yeah. But nope. All of a sudden, it's this symbol that you can't look at it and go, "Oh yeah, that's definitely this." You you have to know what it is. Right. You have to learn it. Wow. Um, so I did three, three, four semesters. Um, as I was finishing up my, my associates. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up at George Mason University, and they had a Japanese program and an international program there. Um, so right. I did a year at George Mason while I was working on getting into the study abroad uh, program, um, which they were like, they were like, you can do it, but you have to have grades here. You don't have grades yet because you transferred in. Mm. So I had to wait. Um, but then I got in uh, and went for a year lived in Japan and that's when kind of that's when I went from like textbook speaking to like actual real human being talking right um, that transition just being there for a year and kind of immersing myself in it that's cool um, so then so so then uh, you were looking at going back to Japan during right. Fukushima that time. didn't happen yeah. that fell through yeah and then so I was like oh I don't know what to do now um, and I was kind of working I was working in theater and, and production and, and uh, like meeting like AV stuff at the time and then an opportunity to go teach in Korea kind of just came up and I was like oh well that's like that's kind of similar and I'd been interested in Korean culture a little bit like because I've been in Japan and they're very close and there's some there's some bleed over effect between right. the two countries and did you speak Korean? So, no okay no wow. not at all not at all um but there, you know, it's just like, oh, like Korea's cool too. I'd love to be over there. And, yeah. And I'm still in, get to be in Asia, and there's some similarities, but there's also a lot of differences, uh, and also that the martial arts thing, like, is from Korea. So it's like, yeah, that I hadn't even really thought of that. And then it happened. So in 2012, like, I went through the process of like applying for a, for a school, and they're like, yeah, let's go, let's do it. Um, so they they pay your whole way, they pay your ticket. And they, they help pay for housing. And you go to Korea and you don't know Korean? Right. What? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're crazy, Dave. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's insane. But I, was, I, had, I had already lived in Japan for a year. Okay. So live, going to another country where you're unfamiliar with everything yeah. wasn't that scary of a prospect. Right. I doubted it a little bit right before, like in the summer and the lead up, because I left in, I think, August, the yeah. end of August. And over that summer, I was talking to my friends like, what the fuck am I doing? That's... Is this is this a good idea? Is this a terrible idea? But other people do it all the time. Like yeah. it's not an uncommon thing. Yeah. Um, I yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I I, I get it. It's that's just that's crazy. I mean, I don't think I would have the courage to do something. Like that. <laughs> um, but since I had already been abroad before, it was yeah. It, and when you go as a college student, there's a very large safety net. Because because like. Even there's like when you're doing the application to for the study abroad, there's a part on the on the application that's like, would you like us to send a student to pick you up from the airport? And it's like, mm. yes, you know, because yeah. and when I got there, there were there were two uh, uh, Japanese students who had little signs with names on it, and they picked me up and another guy who was yeah. on the same plane. We ended up becoming best friends later because we were living together, but we didn't you know we didn't know each other right. at that point. But we rode the train from Tokyo into the city or from the airport into Tokyo City and went to our dorms and that whole thing. Um, but in Korea, I was like, yeah, I don't 
I don't need anything. Wow. I don't need anyone. I just I just need to know where to buy food and where to buy clothes and yeah. and where to get a phone. So how long how long after moving to Korea were you not not fluent but you know conversational in Korean? Um I was I was my first year I was a little resistant to picking up the language. I I got what I needed to like call a taxi. There's no Ubers there yet at the time. Um I think there are now. But to to get a taxi and like talk to the cashier at the grocery store and like yeah. that kind of stuff. But like my bosses all spoke some English. Okay. And, and you're my, teaching English for work. Right. In so, English. Right. So my kids can speak okay-ish to pretty pretty competent English. Right. Um, and my my coworkers, my co-teachers spoke English mm. really well. So they would help me with stuff. So I didn't have a need for it in that first year, really. Got it. Um, and also I was just like, oh, I'm just kind of getting used to like being here and like yeah. learning about stuff and learning yeah. how things work. So like, I'm going to just, I'm, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to go take classes. I'm just going to kind of hold off and I'm just going to kind of let myself get used to being yeah. here and see what everything's like. Um, and that was also the same, that first year is when I started CrossFit. Like officially that's when I started CrossFit wow. was in that year. Cool. And the only reason I started, I had seen it on TV. I saw the 2012 games, Yeah. Uh, the CrossFit games on TV before I went. Um, and I was like, wow, like that's really interesting. If I ever have a chance to do it, I'm gonna check it out. Yeah. And then I saw it, I was doing martial arts stuff at the time, but I was not quite getting enough enough workout from it. Right. Like I wasn't sweating. Yeah. And I wasn't getting my heart rate up. You um, were moving, which is good, but right. it's you know, it's, right. it's like going for a walk. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I saw an advertisement for a CrossFit gym that was close to me. And it was in it was advertised in English, so I went. Someone must speak English there, <laughs> and I went there, and there was their the the their administrator was a Korean American mm. uh, uh, woman, and uh, she was like a college student or college TA or something. Um, so she spoke English, and the other coaches spoke like a little English. Um, but I started doing CrossFit there. I think that's what got me like starting to use Korean language more. Because they didn't speak a whole lot of English, but I would hear them talk about the body terminology oh. and stuff and the movement stuff. Yeah. And just going day in and day out and hearing them say the same things right. to the other mm -hmm. to the other Korean members yeah. and seeing like, okay, he's telling him to – he's pointing at his hips and like going back. So this phrase must mean – move your hips back. Right, right, right. And I could do that because I had already picked up Japanese to a high degree. Yeah. Korean and Japanese language are very similar. Yeah, yeah. Grammar's almost identical. They share a lot of vocabulary yeah. the way English and Spanish do. Um, so it was a lot easier to pick up. That makes sense. Um, but I would just kind of sit and listen. And like, and that's how I, would, I did most of my learning for Korean language. I never, I never did classes. Right. Um, a lot of the teachers there would like spend their weekends going to like three hour language classes in the morning at a college and I'm like I don't want to do that yeah I want to go out and do stuff just pick it up you right. know like just immerse in the culture and, and I, I think with your Japanese background I think you hit the nail on the head I mean there's I don't it would be so hard for me if I just woke up in Korea right it would take me decades right and I remember <laughs> uh very distinctly like kind of noticing my ability to pick pick up language like that yeah. in this situation I was at a I was at my cross one of my CrossFit boxes that I had joined, uh, this was like later on, and um, at this box they, they do uh, protein shakes, like they make protein shakes there, they have a little bar. Yeah. And I had asked my coach, who's the owner, I was like, hey, can I get like a whatever shake, you know, real quick? And she was like, yeah, okay. And then she turned and she yelled at the, the other coach who was doing admin duties at times, like, you know, hey, go make David a, a shake. And then he, he kind of responded back with something kind of like mewling. Mm -hmm. It was just like, ah. and then she's, and then she kind of like yelled a little, like a little bit more sterner tone back at him. And I laughed after this conversation yeah. between the two of them happened. She goes, what are you laughing at? And I was like, oh, well, like you yelled at him to go and make the shake and he didn't want to do it. And you told him if he didn't do it, yeah. that like you would dock his pay or something. And she's <laughs> like, yeah, that's exactly what I said. How do you know that? You don't speak Korean. And I was like, no, but I got it. Right. Like I understood what you were trying to tell him. And she's yeah. like, that's really impressive and weird. Like I don't. I don't think I've met any foreigners who do that. I was like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. It just, it just if you listen enough. Yeah, for sure. For you sure. You start to pick up on, on the context. Sometimes the context of situations and language learning is far more important than the actual words being said. Right. So you found CrossFit in Korea. Mm. 
Yep, huge community out there. If you're ever uh, thinking about going to South Korea and you do CrossFit, um, tons of really amazing boxes and yeah. really amazing athletes out there. That's so definitely uh, try to find yourself a, a box to drop in at. That's, um, that's crazy. I believe I started in a in a franchised box called Sentinel. Mm. Um, I believe they recently closed, or most of their facilities have closed. Um, something's going on there. I only heard about it very, very uh, in a tertiary sort of way. Right. I'm not, I'm not staying, keeping up with what's going on there. But right. um, I know they had some structural issues. Yeah. Um, but I, I really enjoyed all the coaches that worked for them and the sort of the structure and style of it in general. Um, so much so that because um, I started at one. In, I, I lived in a southern city called Busan, and then after my first year, I moved up further up, all the way to the north side of South Korea. Right. I was basically as far north as you could get. And then um, there were no other CrossFits where I was living, and so there was a Sentinel gym because they were franchised, but it was like two hours away. Uh, um, but I was like, well, I really like this franchise, and I love the coaches, and I love the way they do stuff, and the facility was beautiful. Yeah. And I was like, I'm in it. I'm. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. And so I did it for a month, and I would wake up at seven, and I would get on the train at eight. I would ride the train for an hour and a half, and then I would get off and walk to the gym for another fifteen minutes. So it'd take me basically two hours door to door. Then I would do the eleven o'clock class, finish, get back on the train at twelve thirty, come back two hours to my neighborhood, get back at two thirty, eat lunch, and then go to work. And I did that. Like four days a week. Holy crap. Yeah. That's how into it I was at that point. That's insane. <laughs> and and uh, I did it. I did that for probably seven or eight months. Man. Yeah. My, my CrossFit journey would not start that way. <laughs> wow. Okay, cool. Um, man, I'm still digesting that. <laughs> I closed my mind four hours just to get a workout. Right. So, so what what about CrossFit did, I mean, what was so powerful about it that led to a four-hour commute? Um, I, we touched on it really lightly earlier. Um, part of it was the, the self-discipline side of it that I immediately connected with from right. the martial arts thing. The, the class style of it, because in martial arts, that's almost how everything is. You right. do things with a class and you have your classmates. Right. And you train together and you kind of build together. And granted, like, I wasn't becoming, like, best friends with all the Korean people because they maybe spoke very little English. And I still spoke very little Korean. Right. But I did make friends, even in my first box, which I was only there for maybe six months. But I made friends, and we would hang out together. And we had a, a couple of beaches, like, public beaches, that were very nice. And we'd go out to the beaches together, and we'd, we'd have lunch or coffee together, and they'd spoke... I, I met uh, a couple, and the, the, the girl spoke some Japanese, but no English. So we communicated in Japanese, kind of, and she would like relay what I was saying to her boyfriend, and her boyfriend would ask me questions, and she would kind of ask me in Japanese. And yeah. So like, we cool. made it work. We made it work in different ways. Um, so it was kind of the, it was the, the okay. first thing that caught your eye was this idea of like, it being similar to the martial arts it felt experience. to me. It felt it felt like the same thing. But then you're learning a, a whole new set of skills. Because I had never done barbell stuff before. Right. I, you know, every every guy probably goes and does bench press at a gym when they go on their own at some point in their life. Yeah. But I didn't know how to use the barbell. Right. I never learned, and no one had ever taught me. So they're like, "Yeah, we're gonna teach you how to use and yeah. do all the things." And to me, that was like cool. Yeah. That was so cool. That's awesome. And where not a lot of other sports had really caught my interest like that. Uh, and I had done, by that point I had done a lot. I had done uh, all different forms of martial arts, a whole bunch of different stuff. I had done a ton of different other sports. So nothing really caught me the same way. Yeah. And then this just it caught my interest because it felt very similar but with different, way different modes. And uh, it became a challenge that I liked because I had to unlearn some of the things I did in martial arts, some of my body habits, the way I squatted, the way I moved my feet, the depth that I would want to. In martial arts, you're kind of on your toes. You're ready. You know, you're ready to move. You're ready. You're, you know, you're sort of bobbing and moving. Right. There's a lot of light, light body movement. But to connect to the barbell and connect to the weights, it's the complete opposite. Heavy. Right. Right. You have to be really connected to the. Connect body. the floor. Right. Grow your roots. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was a that was a good mental challenge for me. Whereas like, 
the martial arts I was doing while I was in Korea was new, mm-hmm. so it was interesting, but it wasn't challenging. Yeah, it was still like within the ballpark of yeah. what you were doing. I'd, I'd do it once and be like, all right, I got it. Let's do the next thing. Yeah. Like, all right, I got this. Can I go kick the bag for a while? I'd, I want to do that because that feels good. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'll, I'm not like bashing those things. I really look. I really enjoyed it. I love my coach that was helping me there. Right. But I just wasn't getting enough out of it. For yeah, myself. for sure, for sure. Um, and I mean, well, what you were talking about earlier. I mean, what you were consciously or not, what you were getting out of martial arts was this, this self, this process for self improvement. Mm-hmm. Right. You were getting discipline. You were getting. You 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 constantly had this challenge, and it was overcoming that challenge, and and your self reflection or whatever the word that you used that was much better than self reflection. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you're you're using you're using this thing as a way to improve yourself, mm-hmm. and it, and by improving yourself, your life improves. Everything sort of comes into place because you're focused on this one thing. Right. And when you sounds like when you started you know playing around with other martial arts, it just wasn't the challenge wasn't as big. And when the challenge isn't as big, there's not as much opportunity for self improvement. Right. Oh, my right. piece need together. Right. Doctor Sean in go. the house. There you go. Call me Freud. Do I have to pay for that? <laughs> no. Yeah. That's that's super. That's really interesting because one of the themes of a lot of the conversations I've been having recently is this idea of challenge being a super important obstacle in what we do as as, as humans because it's the cha- It's it's the process of overcoming the challenge that makes us learn more about ourselves. Right. And that theme is coming up over and over and over again, and it's 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 really fascinating to me because your default your default human want is to sit on the couch right. and do nothing. Right. You know, conserve energy. I guess you could go back to like caveman days. You don't know when you're going to need that energy to fight the lion. Right. right now that we're not fighting the lion, it's almost. You know, we don't have the challenge of, of getting food every day, of getting water every day, of staying alive every day. Right. And so we sort we need to replace those those primal challenges with to some extent artificial challenges. Sure. You know, like kicking a bag and being able to do this form in the grand scheme of things is utterly meaningless. Sure. But to an individual it can have a lot of meaning. Yeah. So CrossFit CrossFit was, was the new challenge. Right. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah, it was a huge challenge. And it still is a challenge. Like, sure. It's never not challenging, which which is also what I like about it, too. It's never not challenging. Like, <sighs> martial arts can always be challenging. It can be as challenging as you want it to be. Yeah. And there's always a ton of... There's things that I have not even gotten close to touching or learning. There's weapons out there that I've never been able to, to really focus on and mm-hmm. learn. There's styles out there that I've not been able to touch and learn um, that I could. But um, I would, I would imagine that outside of a few really specific things, I'd probably pick up on things pretty quickly. Yeah. But um, CrossFit is still always a continuous challenge. It never gets easier. Mm-hmm. You get better at doing things, but then you just put more weight on once you get better at it, and then it's yeah. harder again. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, well, it's it's the idea that certainly Taekwondo could have continued to offer you the challenges. It's just you didn't connect with it at the same point in your life when, you know, the way that you connect with CrossFit. That doesn't mean the challenges of of getting eight degree black belts in Taekwondo are any less valuable than the challenges of CrossFit. It's your relationship with those challenges that matters, right? right? How, like, do you want it? And if, if no, I mean, then it's not going to be a challenge because you don't care about it, right? Right? Like it has to be something that that you're really invested in. Yeah. And so the next chapter of your life wasn't necessarily about digging a mile deep or ten miles deep on this one very specific martial art. It was totally changing and learning something brand new. Yeah. And uh, and um, to a similar degree, so a lot of the the challenge that comes out of martial arts eventually is all about you and probably one other person yeah like fighting fighting improv. or competing or something yeah uh, there there can be very singular focus to it and some people stay in that mode mm-hmm. and that's awesome if they can um but very often it's because there's another person involved uh but crossfit doesn't need that it doesn't use that right yes there are competitive parts to it you can compete with your people in your class you can compete with other times on the board you can compete with whoever you want but by and large it's about you and you just compete with yourself yeah and so that part i think connected with me super hard right because i was kind of over at that point i was over 
trying to compete with other people all yeah. the time. And so I was able to just be like, no, this is just about me. It's just about my own self-improvement. Right. Um, and so that's that's the way that kind of really hooked me in, yeah. I think. No, that's, that's, that's really interesting. The idea of, I mean, just being you, of there being a challenge every single time. Right. I mean, every time you, you do a workout, it ends in failure, yeah. you know? You, you're either, you're hitting muscular failure, you, you set the bar down, you take a rest, and then it's that struggle to, to get back, to get back on that bar. Yeah. And I love, I love the idea that it, it's, it's kind of, I mean, the, the negative way of saying it is everybody, everybody fails in the CrossFit workout. Sure. The positive way to say it is that everybody succeeds because everybody finishes, everybody does more than more than they thought that they were capable of mm-hmm. you know even if you're a little disappointed in your performance at the end of a workout i mean you still succeeded because you you did a, a really a, a ton of really good reps or you know whatever it is but it's this idea that every single time you step up to the bar or you step up to the workout you're gonna fail you're gonna explore your relationship with you know failure and let, let's get back on the horse let me pick this up positive self-talk and it's just a constant it's a constant tug in uh, tug of war, I guess, with with your own uh, with your own brain and your desire to uh, not not do anything, yeah. and then make yourself do something. You know, I don't know. For me, it's been like I had a very similar uh, discovery of CrossFit, and it, you know, for me, it was I grew up swimming, doing high level swimming basically my entire life, and then. Being detached from that, I remember being out of shape for the first time in my life. Mm. Like I, I was unaware of what out of shape was. Right. You know, I thought out of shape was not swimming for two weeks and then getting in the pool and, ooh, five thousand yards. That was tough. Uh, <laughs> you know, but yeah. th- for the first time in my life, it was, it was. I remember, I remember. I, I'll, I'll never forget this. This was crazy. So, we're doing. So I graduate. I graduate college, and all through all through college at the Naval Academy, you do a mile and a half PRT run. It's push up sit ups and a mile and a half run, and I was in great swimming shape every single every single time. So we would do these mile and a half runs, and you had to run under ten thirty, which looking back is a pretty fast time. You know, not like jaw droppingly fast, but but pretty fast. Yeah. And you had to run faster than a nine nine. 10 or 9 30 or some, somewhere in the nines you had to run faster than like a, if you max the push-ups max the sit-ups you had to beat basically nine minutes and then you got um got an a okay and so that's what you had to do you had to beat nine nine minutes and i remember feeling like i was running slow mm-hmm. like easy running like out for a jog 855 whatever easy running and that's that's pretty good mm-hmm go to the submarine I'm on the submarine not, not even the submarine I go to the training school for the for the for the submarine and I've just been in school for six months not working out at all and so it's probably been a year since I worked out and my brain is still this guy who can traipse across a finish line at nine minutes I was like let me just see where I'm at I'm gonna run really really hard I'm gonna yeah. run as, as hard as I can yeah. and I run and I run and I'm pushing I'm dying and I cross the finish line at like 1235 <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I, I thought I heard wrong I was figuring out how that was possible maybe I started late did I run an extra lap you know all, all lines checked I I was just horribly out of shape 1235 I was like oh no this is terrible but anyway so I found I found CrossFit and uh, and the challenge of that and the, the idea of not knowing how to do barbell lifts and just wanting to be a total beginner at something that wasn't swimming, that wasn't anything that I was coming in with a previous skill at. Because, right. you know, I looked at triathlons, I looked at other things, but just this idea of being brand new at something and starting from square zero, that was awesome to yeah. me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was just a, a really cool challenge. Yeah. And for me, like, I remember my very first CrossFit workout. I have been doing all the, the martial arts stuff up until that point. And like I was saying, like I wasn't quite getting like enough like heart rate up, you know, Metcon conditioning kind of stuff at the time. But I would stay late and I would do, my coach let me, the owner of the dojo let me stay and do my own little workout for like 20, 30 minutes because there was, there, he didn't have a lot of clients. So I would just stay and I would, I would do some sprints and do some like burpees and hit the bag and then do some, and like just sweat a bit. Yeah. And so then, you know, I was going over for my first CrossFit class and I was like, oh, this probably won't be 
the, the same the same expectation that I almost always had going into a martial arts school was like, I, I don't imagine this is going to be as hard as everyone says it is. I usually pick up on this stuff pretty quickly. Right. It'll probably just be, it'll be fun. It'll have yeah. a good fun workout. I don't remember what the workout is. I just remember it started with wind sprints. And the little and it wasn't a big gym. It was a small little box. Right. But we just did kind of a bunch of wind sprints up and down. And I was just like, I'm just going to go as hard as I can on these wind sprints because yeah. I like wind sprints. Right. And I did them. And then I was like out. I was out of breath for the rest of the like 40 minutes because right. we kept doing stuff and I couldn't catch my wind right. back. Yeah. And I was just like, fuck. And then at the end of the, work, the workout end and I immediately went to the bathroom and I puked <laughs> right away. And then I walked out and I went, yep, this is it. This, this is, is perfect. It. This is what I want. Yeah. This is what I've been looking for. Because nothing else had made me feel that out of shape. Right. At all. Right. Uh, and I was like, okay, this is a different level of, of physicality totally. that I haven't seen yet. That I haven't, I haven't touched yet. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, that's, that's what definitely pulled me in on the first day. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. My, my first day was me getting out of breath and then being unable to do anything. <laughs> like you were trying to keep up and like trying to get your wind back. Right. I was doing Cindy, which were, uh, and the first time I did it, I mean, I was, the coach put 20 tick marks on the, on the board and was like, 20 is a pretty good score. We'll see where you end up. Sure. And so, I, you know, 20 minute workout. I was like, all right, I'll do one round a minute, five pull ups, 10 push ups, 15 squats. No big deal. Easy to do in a minute. Sure. You know, come on. I do it again on the second minute. I do it again on the third minute. I'm starting to breathe hard. The, the squats are getting difficult. Right. I'm breaking up the pull-ups now. Right. I do it again on the fourth minute. And so I'm on track for 20 through four minutes. Right. And then the next 16 minutes. Then you drop off the cliff. Yeah. yeah. It took me 16 minutes to do four more rounds. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. It was so bad. I finished with eight. Eight. And there were times like I was just staring at the pull-up bar and I was just... It's just for like five minutes yeah. and I was, I was, I mean, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. And the coach was like, that's, that's, that's pathetic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I, I remember yeah. one of the early workouts that had, they had just put a hundred pull-ups in the workout. Um, and I was like, that should be easy. I'm good at pull-ups. I can do those. I got to like 25. Mm -hmm. I was dying. I was straight. I think I maybe finished fifty in the in the remaining like forty minutes of the class. Yeah. To get to fifty, and I was just like, "Wow, how can I? How 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 can you put a hundred pull ups on the board and other stuff and be fit enough to do that and do more stuff?" Right. Uh, like, how do I get there? Do you think that uh, this is kind of a loaded question? In what in what ways? Uh, like, what? How does? How did your martial arts experience play into your ability to pick up CrossFit? Yeah. You know, like. Did, did it change your approach? Was it just totally new? Did you bring in that discipline? You know, how, how, does, how does martial arts translate to uh, CrossFit in terms of how quickly you learn? Yeah, so, I mean, like, from the physicality standpoint, it was really tough because it's such a different way of using your body mm. in motion. Um, yeah, it's, complete, it's, it's completely different, way, especially TKD but probably most of the martial arts that right. are stand-up fighting it, because it's the, uh, it's the inverse of everything that you want to do. Mm. Um, so that took a long time to unteach and unlearn. Right. But that was, I think I enjoyed that aspect of like, I got to try and get myself out of this mode. Yeah. Um, now that I've learned both, I can switch between the two. Um, but it took a while yeah. to get there. Um, but I think from the sort of mental side of things, um, It was, it became, so I, I touched on this kind of uh, a little bit, the, those times in the black belt testing cycle where, you know, Arlene would take us and, and we would do classes just with her mm. for like five or six weeks. Right. And they were very intense. Yeah. And they were, you, you had to be focused the entire time. There was no time to relax and be goofy mm -hmm. during these class times. They were laser focused. Mm -hmm. And she was right there, like in your head, in your ear getting you to do stuff, pushing you through to a place that you normally didn't do in the normal classes, right. right? And so that feeling was the exact same feeling that I had to use in the CrossFit classes. Interesting. And I hadn't felt that thing yeah. in, since I was 14 years old. Right. That was the last time I felt that. Yeah. And I did wrestling competitions because I was doing Olympic style wrestling and you know, that took some intensity, but it didn't feel the same. And I did track and field and I did a lot of running and that was very in your own head when you get running, but it didn't feel the same. 
Yeah. And I did swimming, and I, I was sucked at it. Um, so that's different. But uh, but I had and even going back to martial arts, uh, and and as an adult and do like I kind of got it there when I was right. coaching and I was able to do some competitions again. But it wasn't until it really wasn't until those first six months of CrossFit that I felt the same as I did when I was fourteen. And that feeling is. It's sort of, I mean, it sounds like it's kind of a flow state where you're you're trying to do something that's so challenging that's requiring your total focus for the time that you're doing it, yeah. and it's physically demanding. Yep. And um, that intensity of exercise, a lot of times, like the CrossFit, the CrossFit definition of intensity is going faster and going heavier. It's one of those two things, right? right. You increase your intensity by increasing one of those two yep. things, or decreasing one of those two things. Or both. <laughs> or both, right? But for me, the intensity of training was how much of your like consciousness and like your effort you're putting into like each individual movement. Mm. Um, what I was talking about, like doing each movement to the best that you possibly can all the time. Yeah. Right. That ninety percent training isn't enough. Right. It has to be a hundred percent, and it has to be a hundred percent the whole time. Right. So well, it's kind of like those, like when you were describing the forms. Like every single detail of the form. Where's your foot position? Right. Where's the? How's the punch executed? No detail is unimportant. Right. Every detail is important. Yeah, and that's that's really similar that you that you sort of picked that up and that you saw that so quickly in your CrossFit experience. Right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that took me like four years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I was able to to like verbalize it at the time. Yeah. But I think that's what was keeping me going with it is right. was it it felt that it felt like that yeah it, it felt the same yeah well i mean you know you you have a lifetime of practice in a, in a very specific way and you bring that mindset to another challenge and yeah. you're gonna you're gonna focus in on the really small details of things yeah and i'd imagine that got you you know that accelerated your learning curve in a way that got you pretty quick were pretty good pretty quick I would imagine um I was pretty bad my first year I've, I've told the story a few times to some different people but I was I was terrible my first year and I had a, a, a another member that I worked out with together uh, pretty consistently uh, her name is Jen uh, not my sister um, but her name was Jen and then at some point during that year she moved she was in Korea she moved back to California and she was doing some stuff there and then she came back to Korea to look for some fitness style working yeah this was like three years later so i've been doing crossfit the whole time since then and i was at a totally different box in a totally different city and she she came to visit and she came to the to the box i was working at we worked out together and then we went and we're like getting some food afterwards and yeah. we're sitting and just like catching up because we hadn't seen each other for a few years and she was like yeah she's like oh, you know i was I, it was it was fun working out again i was like yeah you know we were reminiscing about the old space she goes yeah you know, I remember like those first six months when you were there, I thought you were going to quit because you were real bad. And I was just like, thanks. And she's like, no, 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 because like you're really good now. And you've improved so much. But yeah, I was not good. And yeah. like a lot of, um, I think, guys tend to do this. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of female athletes will do this too if they're new to CrossFit. I would always want to go to failure on a movement. Yeah. I would want to do as many squats as I could to when the point when I stood up and then I had to like throw the bar off. Right. Or as many, you know, uh, handstand push-ups as I could tolerate till I did one and then I fell off the wall. Yeah. And my coach at the time, uh, his name was Wanu, and he gave me like a really good, like really small coaching nugget, which was like, look, we want to go to the point of almost failure. Yeah. But you need to learn where that point is. Right. Because if you're going to failure every single time, you're wasting your time. Yeah. Don't waste your time. Right. And that was just like, that like changed my perception right. of. Because it, it takes more time to recover from, from, a, a, from failed a deep rep. red line right. and from a failed rep than it does from, you know, two reps before. Right. Set the bar down, two breaths. Now you, now you have 10 more reps in you where if you go to those two more reps and now you're failure. You're down for two minutes right. or whatever. Yeah, that's, and that totally changed my perspective wow. on how I was approaching movements and workouts and stuff. And I think that even changed how I approach martial arts. I haven't got to do a lot since then, yeah. but I think that would totally change how I would do stuff there if I got back into a training mode right. with martial arts stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. For me, it was the opposite because I my entire swimming career is is living in the world of failure. You know, like body failure, 
you know, just push yourself to the absolute limit and you want that last stroke to be the last stroke you have. Right. You don't want the last stroke you have to be a 25 to go in the race. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, your whole career of swimming is learning how to like delicately balance that line right. of going out fast enough to, to be in the race and to mm -hmm. put a good time, but not so fast that you, that you kill yourself. Right. And so my entire swimming career had been around pacing and you know doing all of these explorations of my own self. And in doing so, I, I, I really started to hate what it feels like to be in pain, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Right. And so when I started CrossFit, it was, it was a lot of fun because there's some aspect of that going back. But for me, I was so far on the other end of the spectrum. It would like, I would, I would put the bar down, not, not before failure, not before like getting, you know, whatever, but just as I, as it started to get hard. I'd put the bar down and be like, come on, pick the bar up. You can do this. Right. And for me, it was learning, learning how to get back into that mental toughness of getting towards failure, yeah. you know? And that's, what's really interesting to me about, about the pursuit of CrossFit and about doing CrossFit and all these things is this idea that like, it's, it's a different challenge for everybody, right? right? You, the, the challenge that it presents to you is the challenge that you need to overcome as, as a human. Mm -hmm. And because you know, like my tendency is to give up on things, you know, it's like, Oh, when the goal gets, gets tough, like my, my, de my default reaction is to just quit. Like if we're, if we were going to, if we we're planning a big backpacking trip and I knew how hard it was going to be. And then it started raining or something. I'd be like, Oh, well, no cancel. We got to let's, let's go to the bar. Yeah. You're like, dude, mm -hmm. we have ponchos. Right. We're walking. Right. Like, ah, yeah, you're right. Your skin can get wet. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, this is this has been great. Um, I know you got to go. Yep. So what? Um, you know, any final thoughts for people listening? I mean, one of my biggest takeaways from this conversation is this this idea of cultivating self actualization, self accountability, and then applying that like in everything that you do. Yeah. And I think that's sort of the the David Drew martial arts approach to life. I think I think anyone who's gone through college, you know, and is is a functioning adult of, of modern society has had to do it at some point, whether mm. it's, you know, finishing those last couple of papers when you needed to graduate or following through on work stuff, a project or whatever. Pe people have found it. Just right. chances are you found it at some point, but it's being able to activate that when you want to and when you need to mm. um so a lot of times people do it and it happens unconsciously because someone's putting it on top of you right yeah. here's here i need you to complete this workout and yeah. now now i've put that on your head here's the challenge right do it the difference is being able to do it yourself on demand yeah. and that's a lot harder that takes time i think for a lot yeah. of people that takes time to find that right but um once you do then you can you can turn it on and off at will and I can do it. You can, like in in a in any given workout. Um, I might set myself like a mini goal within the workout. So right. it might be okay. I'm trying to beat my time from last time, or I'm trying to do more weight. But maybe it's like okay, well that's there. But you know what? Let me see if I can get through this whole workout and not put the bar down at all for the whole thing. Right. Or um, I I I did this when I was still training before I was coaching. I went through like three months of. Um, I'm going to do this workout and I'm going to keep my heart rate at this number and I'm not going to go past it. Right. And I'm going to control my breathing and my heart rate. I'm going to figure out how that works. Right. But no one, no one did that. No coach told me to come over and, Hey, let's work on breathing and heart rate control. I was just like, I have this goal that I want to make and I'm going to do it myself. Yeah. And I just did it yeah. because I wanted to learn about that and figure that out for my own self. Mm -hmm. Um, but that only comes from being able to like, Okay, now every workout I had to stop and reflect on what happened in that workout and see what kept my heart rate correct or why I spiked over too much right. and adjust based on those things. Yeah. Um, so, but it is, I think it is definitely something everyone can learn and do. Yeah. But um, just finding the right path. So, just super quickly, ways to practice it in a CrossFit setting. Just like you said, set little mini goals. Yeah, I think mini goals within workouts can be great. Um, I know one I talk about, uh, talk about with a lot of people, especially recently, is the hook grip. Uh, people not not utilizing the hook grip yeah. on on clean and snatch based movements. Yeah, and like where to use those outside of doing cleans and snatches. Right. Right. So one that tends to come up a lot is like on deadlifts. Right. If you have a workout that's a lot of deadlifts, but maybe it's kind of light. 
see if you can hook grip all of yeah. them, right? So you're learning how to do that or, you know, challenge yourself to do it through the whole day. Interesting, um, yeah. Or, yeah, a workout maybe that you've done before and last time you did all kipping pull-ups. Try to do it with all strict pull-ups, yeah. right? It's going to take you longer. Yeah, it's yeah. going to take you longer, yeah. but but you'll learn something from it. And then I think there's there's always these movements, you know, like an air squat or something where, where you can do more of them you know, you can you can always do another air squat. Right. You know, the thing I, I say jokingly is air, air squats are like chicken nuggets. You can always have another one, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so set little goals of trying to get to 20, try to get to 30. Don't stop until this. Don't put the bar down. Don't, right. you know, and I think when you start practicing those little tiny mini disciplines, then you start seeing it a lot more in your life. And then right. you can be more like David. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, man. This was awesome. Yeah.